Morning, Professor. Or Good evening, sir. Hello. Good afternoon. All right. All right. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Noelia. Thank you. Good afternoon, Zitlali. Thank you. Good afternoon, David. Thank you. Uh, it's still okay. Getting set up. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yes. G. Catherine and and G. G. So to speak. Uh, good afternoon, Tomika. That's awesome. Good afternoon, Michelle. Good afternoon, Janine. Sorry. Good afternoon, Catherine. Oh, wait. So she. Oh, so that wasn't a joke. That was a okay. I thought it was like good game, but like without the game. Okay. Um. Uh. Good afternoon, Renice. Uh, right. Type. Okay. Right. Sweet. Um. We put a lot of GGs into Among Us, my son and I. And when you mess up a GG in Among Us, you make enemies fast, as I'm sure some of you know. Um, my son always pretends that he's either Shari or uh, that other, or uh, 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 what's that other evil guy? He always totally dresses up and completely pretends to be that famous guy. And then it really freaks people out. Anyway, whatever. Okay. Clearly, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's no reason you should. But uh, good afternoon, Hoi Yin. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I'm muttering to myself because I'm in a meeting. Oh, more people coming. Okay. Good afternoon, Shankia. I still don't understand this. Who can see your messages recording on things coming? But okay. Okay. I think so. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Hello. Um, okay. We, oh, no, more people coming. Sorry. I'm a little bit, I apologize in advance. I hope I'm a little bit funkadelic at the moment. I mean, in the bad way, not the good way, but I will be. Oh, good afternoon, Juanita. Thank you. Um, no, I'm sure I will be up to speed momentarily. I think perhaps I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit funkified because you have an exam and I get funkified too. I mean, in the bad way. Um, I don't love exams any more than you do, but, um, and I don't want to make it any worse than it is, but let, let's get to it. Uh, wait, if everybody's here, I think everybody's here. I think we're recording. Um, like the deal is, okay. Okay, just to clarify again, and this is just all in the way of information and all in the way of what of no hide the ball. Okay, I, I, I'm a big believer. I mean, physics exams can be difficult. Physics can be difficult by itself. I'm not here to lie. I'm not say that it's easier than it is. I am here to make it as undifficult as I can. That is my job. Physics and nature are already complex. We are here to try to get our minds around nature and physics. That is our goal together. That doesn't mean it always works. I'm imperfect, you're imperfect. But we're on the same side in terms of we want physics to be clear. Ultimately, it does take some time for physics to be clear. I've put a little more time into it than some of you. Just know again, though, that anything I know about physics at this point is because I've put in time, really. Like most of you are starting already, I really believe, with either more IQ or more science. But I'm not that I'm crying me a river, but there's no advantage that I bring to the table that you don't have except for a lot of time in the physics. Oh, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Um, why am I saying all that? Oh, mind you, to remind you that we do have an exam coming up, um, the logistics of it, are, the logistics of this exam, of this midterm exam, are that it will be posted through Google Classroom no later than 7 p.m. tomorrow, maybe a little bit earlier, but you know, like maybe somewhere between 6 and 7, but no later than 7 p.m. tomorrow on Google Classroom. But good afternoon, Liani. Awesome. Thank you. It'll be posted, it'll look like a big assignment. Like it'll be called an exam and it'll be worth a hundred points, but it'll just look like an assignment thing in your Google Classroom. It'll be posted by 7 p.m. tomorrow. It, it will have equations in it, whatever. It'll have problems that you have to solve in it. You, you will take it home or you, know, you will download it, print it, whatever, whatever. You will look out and watch Google Classroom just in case I find any errors or have to update anything, in which case I let you know and, and then you, you, know, you forgive me and you respect those changes, whatever. The whole thing is due back to me by no later than 1.15 p.m. Monday, 
right? So you're going to, and I know for some of you, you've heard this now a million times. Some of you might be hearing this for the first time right now. The exam gets posted 7 p.m. Uh, by 7 p.m. tomorrow. It is due back to me no later than 1.15 p.m. Monday, i.e. it's due back to me right before class on Monday, and then you show up to class. Like, even if you often don't come to class, even if you've noticed that I'm loose about attendance, even if you think you can do this whole course without coming to classes, which is your business, consider that class day like an exam day, like it's part of your exam that you show up that day, that you stand up and be counted and show your peers that you've turned in the exam, okay? That day is important, even if you end up leaving early. Um, the exam, uh, let me just look in the chat again. Again, I'm saying things uh, not to scare anybody, but to be as clear as possible because exams, because I'm very loose about a lot of things, but I'm not that loose about exams. So I want it to be super clear. Plus most of you care about your exam grades and stuff. So again, it's posted by 7 p.m. tomorrow in Google Classroom. It's due back to me through Google Classroom and before 1.15 p.m. on Monday, uh, this coming Monday. Uh, the 1.15 thing is rigid. Like you have to meet that deadline unless you've communicated with me in advance about extenuating circumstances, right? And, um, but in between that time, and I'm going to repeat this probably one more time. People are continuing to come in. Again, for anybody who's coming in now, I'm right now, I'm talking about the logistics of this exam. Let me, in fact, before I repeat myself anymore, let me say, well, I'll just pause for a second. Let me say as clearly as possible, I do take exams seriously. There are aspects of this exam that you're going to, uh, good afternoon, no, no problem, no, no problem. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. yeah, yeah, no, no, no problem. And thank you for saying good afternoon. And thank you for saying it publicly. No problem. To everybody, right now, I'm talking about the logistics of this exam. I definitely don't want to spend two and a half hours on logistics. I definitely don't want to scare anybody or anything like that. Like if you're already mellow and cool, I'm not trying to make you less mellow, but I am trying to be clear because uh, an exam is kind of like a contract moment between faculty and students, right? So the one thing that I could say to be, so, and I will be a little bit unforgiving and uncompassionate about certain aspects of this exam. I, I like to think that I'm super forgiving and super compassionate about most other things. But on the exam, like by the time you take it, if certain aspects of it were not clear to you, I'm going to have to take that to mean that you've like never paid attention in class and like never checked in with anything, which at some point becomes on you, right? So, so I'm going to repeat again in a moment, just like what my expectations are for turning in the exam. I'm going to repeat them in a moment, even if you've missed them. But let me also say, even if you miss them right now, like I hope everybody at this point has been to class at least once to know that everything I say in class then gets posted on YouTube. And, and if you have any doubts about any aspect of this exam, whether it's the rules, the expectations, or the material, please, first of all, if, well, first of all, know that you do have my phone number and I probably will put it in the chat one more time. You know, I would be, it would be a little bit weird if one of you texted me to ask something like, super obvious about this exam. Like, be careful, it's not something I've said 400,000 times. Wait, 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 uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, sure, 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 yeah, okay, no, that's a fair question, okay, yeah, oh, definitely, definitely, no, it's something in the direct, yes, I, yes, okay, okay, so let me say, first, on the exam, it's going to be posted by 7 p.m. tomorrow, by 7 p.m. tomorrow, maybe a little bit earlier, not meant to throw anybody, just if I can get it out earlier, I might give you a little bit more time, like, you know, maybe like 6.30 or something, but basically tomorrow evening, it'll be posted no later than 7 p.m., Um, and then it's due back to me by no later than 1.15 p.m. Um, this coming Monday. So you have the full weekend, you know, and Thursday night to do it and stuff. Uh, the, the Sort of the most, so the most important thing is you have to get it in on time and then you have to come to class that day. Other important things are the way you turn it in is just like homework. Hopefully all of you have done at least homework, one homework by this point to see what I'm looking for. You do the whole exam. Okay, I'll answer that in a second. Yeah, fair questions in the direct chat. Hang on. Um, 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 you do the exam all on separate white, uh, well, separate blank pieces of paper. 
I would actually recommend doing drafts. I really would recommend trying things and doing scratch paper and stuff like that first before you turn anything in. I mean, you have five days to do this, but whatever, when you're ultimately turning into me is a bundle is one document full of a bunch of pieces of paper that have been filled out with solutions, full solutions, step-by-step -step solutions by you. Every piece of paper makes clear what question you're on. Like you say, like Roman numeral one, part A, whatever. Then you make the question clear in your words. You don't copy my questions. You don't have to include, in fact, you shouldn't include my sheets. Don't do your work on my sheets, but do always make it clear what you're doing, where you're doing it. Again, in other words, for everybody, you're handing me in a doc by Monday, 115. You're handing me in a document th that fully contains all your solutions to all the required questions. And you're presenting it as thoroughly, as colorfully, as neatly, as, as organizedly as possible. So that, again, to everybody, your goal is to give me a document that I can grade without looking at anything else next to it. Like that's the simplest way I could put it. I think there's really cosmic important reasons for that, but there's also just dumb reasons. If you want to just think of me as a selfish person who's trying to do this quickly, go ahead. Just picture me sitting there. I don't want to fumble back and forth between, I don't want to have to keep on referring to something else to see like what you're doing or why or where. You just keep making it clear to me what you're doing while you're doing it. You make the question clear. You make the sub part of the question clear. You make your thought process clear. I should be able to hand your exam to any friend of mine or Professor Walters or Professor Other Walters or Professor Wu. I should just be able to hand it to anybody who knows physics and they should be like, oh yeah, this makes sense. Oh no, this doesn't make sense. Oh yeah, she really knows what she's doing. Oh no, this is wrong. Like they shouldn't have to have anything else to follow your physics presentation, right? Okay, that's, the, so you're showing as much work as you possibly can. Any moment you have a doubt, if you're like, oh, should I really explain this? Yes, is the answer. And like, you'll never lose points for over explaining things. A quick also side, I know there's two things in the chat and I want to get to stuff. Some people sometimes even at this point ask me, do I believe in partial credit? Oh my God, yes. Like I believe in partial credit so deeply that I'm almost insulted by the question. Like I don't even, I don't believe in partial credit. I believe in everything you do, you get credit. Like the, let me put it another way. If a question is worth five points, if a sub part of a question is worth five points, the only way you get zero points on that is if you leave it actually blank. If you write, if you write, if you show me that you know what the question is, and especially if you write anything even remotely fundamental or relevant, like F equals MA or differential equation, if you write anything that's remote, you've gotten points right there. If the thing is worth five, you're at least getting two for writing down anything relevant at all. And that's just for sure, for real. Okay. So you're just getting points for every true thing you write. If you don't get to a final answer or the final answer is wrong, sure, you don't get all the points. But just think of it as you're trying to give me as much correct and relevant and coherent physics as possible uh, you know, to respond to all my questions. And I, and I will respond to the questions in the chat. And I know I sound intense at the moment. I don't mean to be, but um, I am a little intense at the moment. I want to get to everything. But I also just want to stress again, we're at that moment now where I know most people in the class are like, yeah, yeah, already. Like, Let's just do this thing. But there's always like some people that sort of have been tuning in and out and don't like get the basic deal. And it's time to know the basic deal once it's an exam, okay? If you're wondering, can I still hand in other homeworks and stuff? Yes, but I wouldn't worry about them tonight. Like you probably still could hand in homeworks even after the exam, but don't worry about that now. Just worry about the exam and worry about what it is that I'm looking for. I'm looking for as much work and thoroughness and clarity as possible. And I'm looking for respect. I'm looking at this point for you to show me that you've been in the course and you sort of been following what's going on reviewing solutions based on how we do them in class. Okay, I'm gonna be more specific in a minute. And again, I, for people that have, generally speaking, people who really have been in the class and trying and stuff generally do do a lot better on this exam than they think. But then some, even if they think they're rocky at physics or even if they think they have a weak physics background, people that have a strong physics background or strong math background, but haven't really been in the class often do worse than they think. But the people that do the worst of all are the people that try to get the whole exam from, um, uh, from uh, oh my God, Chegg, okay? So we're gonna address that in one minute. Um, before I go any further and answer the questions in the chat, let me just remind you. So I'm saying all this also be strict because what's generous about the exam, what will surprise some of you and make some of you feel like it's a gift in a way, is you have from Thursday to Monday to do whatever you want to complete this thing. You can go on the web. You can walk back and forth from 
your drafts. Like you don't have to do it in real time by any means. You can certainly look at your notes from class. And I would encourage that actually. Please look at your notes from class while you're doing this exam. Please watch the YouTube videos. Please first and foremost, if you can see, you cheat by trying to use the class to help you rock the exam. That's actually like the point of it. But you also can use the web and you also can use each other. Oh, also that I encourage. The more I think that some of you are somehow getting together or having chat rooms or what's up or blah, blah, blah. Great if you're helping each other. All great. Totally yes. But the key is, and I will answer the questions in the chat. And I know I've said this before. Again, if you feel like you've heard this a million times, good. That probably means you're in good shape. Um, but what I'm saying is it is open universe exam. That's on purpose. I'm not an idiot. Like it's on purpose that it's an open universe exam, including open friends, open colleagues, open uncle, open aunt. And like you can have a seance, you can have a seance and summon the ghost of Einstein, like honestly. But then, and, and then let me know how you did that later on because wow, that's cool. But like, if you do that or you summon Newton or whatever, or you summon your grandmother who got a Nobel prize in Sweden for how good she is at physics or whatever, like all the power to you. But what you then have is your grandmother come and explain this crap to you so that then you can write it down in your words for me. Don't have your grandmother write out the exam for me. Like, I mean, I guess that's obvious, but. The extension of that is use whatever resource you want on the web to explain this stuff, but then your job on the exam is to show as much work and demonstration that you understand as possible. I do have to warn you that when I feel like grading things strictly, like the reason that some people that the average last semester was like a 61 and a 64 is not because I'm looking to punish people at all or whatever, but because this is an exam about integrity. Every, all forms of cheating that you can conceive of are allowed on purpose because, well, for a thousand reasons, but one of them is, and I think I've mentioned this before, that my secret belief is that what it really means to cheat is to have an advantage that your colleagues don't have. What it really means to cheat is to take advantage, in my opinion. What it really means to cheat is to do something that no one else did because they all thought it was honorable not to, like to be the only person that has access to Chegg or something like that. That's cheating, right, I think. Or not, whatever, like if you're in an in-class exam and one of you has a cell phone and you're calling your aunt Sonia while all the rest of you don't have cell phones. Okay, to me, that's super cheating because like, why are you special? Why do you, whoever you are, get to do that when everybody else is trying to be honorable? So what I say is, okay, you're all allowed to do everything. You, like we live in a web world now. We live in a COVID world. We live in an electronic world. Use, you can all have every resource that every one of you has at your fingertips, but then just know that what you're good so there's no cheating because everything is cheating because everybody can do it and everybody can then help each other and i'm not trying to stop that in fact i'm encouraging it but then you have to sit down with your own piece of paper with your own piece of paper and your own signature on it and your own relationship with your own soul or whatever and your own whatever whatever with your own electron or your own heaven or whatever and you and me and you have to write down what you understand and you have to convince me that you actually understand it. And you have to know going in that if I'm grading with any scrutiny or any concern, if I have any time on my hands at all and I'm looking at your work, I so know the difference. I mean, I'm just telling you that. And that's, that. I so know the difference between someone writing down physics that they understand versus someone writing down physics that they got from someone else. First of all, generally the latter, the person who cheats, the person that just gets stuff from Chegg, they generally do that because they're kind of desperate and they kind of haven't been paying attention in the class. So they get the answers to these questions from Chegg or whatever. And what they don't realize is that Chegg does things completely differently from like they use different symbols, they use different notation. And also they use a lot of idiots and they often get a lot of things wrong. And I know that because if you type Yaverbaum into Google images, you will get like a slew of my old homework assignments all over the place and all the Chegg responses to them. And a lot of them are wrong. I'm, st I'm sorry to say like, I, I, and I'm not even trying to make fun of Chegg, although I totally am. I mean, I'm not making fun of you if you have a Chegg subscription, because it probably is good for certain classes in certain contexts, but I'm telling you right now that I, I can spot Chegg a mile away and partly because it's not good physics. Okay. And partly because it uses notation that we don't use in the class and it uses notation that, that it never justifies itself. And it just like spits out. So, that's a harsh example, and I'm not trying to harsh on anybody's mellow, but I'm saying, imagine you're in a Spanish class or, or you know, some foreign language class or, or, or like a Hindi class or so. imagine you're in an Arabic class. 
and they're asking you to write about what you did for your summer vacation in Arabic, or they're writing you to analyze like some book, like the Quran or something in Arabic. Okay. We all know that like, if you don't know Arabic and you just copy the symbols down, or if someone just dictates the essay into the tape recorder and you try to write it down, if you don't know Arabic and you try to fake it that, like anybody who does know Arabic knows that you can't speak or write Arabic, right? If you're not fluent in it and you're not comfortable in it, it copying, it doesn't do you any good, right? If it's supposed to be an original work, you're not gonna get what you did for your summer vacation in Arabic off the web. Same thing here. Okay, I'm gonna stop yelling, but like you're here to show me as honestly as you can, the physics that you understand that's in the exam. Don't go any farther than that go to the limit of what you understand. Now, wait, let me, I'm going to stop. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 okay. Oh, hand raise. That's cool. Okay. The, I'm going to stop babbling for a second. I, there's a hand raise, which is cool. There's also two questions in the private chat. There's also other questions I have to answer. I'm just, I'm here to rant right now, just to basically say the basic deal of the exam is that it is totally take home. It's totally due 115 Monday. It'll be posted Thursday. Anything you want to do between Thursday night and Monday is up to all of you. But the more you understand these rules and expectations, or the more you at least like rewatch the YouTubes or something, the more you'll know what I'm looking for and you won't be surprised or fooled and you will get a good grade. I, um, um, um wait, I, I, I totally, Caleb's raising his hand, but, and there's also, so, wait, sometimes, right? Sometimes, wait, sorry. I totally get that Caleb's raising hand. I appreciate that. Hold on, I'm just getting myself confused. Uh, okay, let, um, all right. Let, um, okay. Wait. Yeah. I'm going to get Caleb. Let me just, because I'm getting nonlinear. Uh, one thing in the chat. Wait. No, actually. All right. All right. Don't let me forget the chat. There's important questions in the chat. I and I know they came first, but my brain is going to fry. So Caleb, you go first. Thank you. All right. Um, I just had two questions. One, you said the test is worth 100 points. Is that scaled in a different way than uh, the games? Oh, oh, you know, that's a really good question. Yeah, yes, it is. Okay, it's 100 points in that you'll get a score like out of 100, like 91 or 88 or whatever. But then yes to everybody to remind you. Yeah, yeah. That's not like just 100 homework points. I mean, that's a really good point. It, it is ultimately worth a lot more than the homework. Just to quickly remind, and this is also in the YouTube videos and whatnot, but just to remind everybody, that exam, you'll get a score out of 100, then you'll get a score out of 100 on the final exam, and then you'll have a final lab average that's out of 100. Those three numbers together get averaged as your base average in this class or as your exam average in this class. Then we scale down all those homework points, that pile of homework points, and add them to that base average. So yeah, it... The exam itself first and foremost counts like, you know, like technically a third of the class, but really like a fourth of the class, then all the homework points get added to it. So yeah, it's a hundred points that are a lot bigger in depth than a hundred homework points. That's a good point. Correct. I mean, Thank you. The, the other thing I want to ask is, um, all right, so we, you, uh, a couple of times you write like, what is the question? I wanted to know just generally, are we always um, for your class, right? Are we always supposed to rewrite the question on our own words, even if we don't feel a bit unsure about it? And if so, is that general as applies to the test or the homework to everything? Great question. Great question. And so to e totally clear question, totally important question to everybody. The answer is yes. And this is one of those, this is maybe why I'm ranting so much right now. Like, like, even if I'm trying, I would ultimately want everybody to sort of see that this is not totally unfair or sort of not hate it. But right now, even if you all hate it, like, yes, for an exam, here's totally what I want. I want you guys to show me what the question is, every step of every, every question. I mean, like every part, right? Like if it's, quote, you know, problem one, part B. If part B is uh, assume, assume the time is three seconds, what's the position? Yes, I want all of you all every time to write something quick. It can be quick and straightforward, just like assume T equals three, x equals question mark like but yes to everybody i want you to make the question clear every time and, and here's the deal here's why this is a fair and important question the way he's asking it i mean it's important because it yeah you people will lose points on an exam for not doing that but i can even see why it's confusing right now why caleb's asking it because when i first started telling you guys to do that oh a, well hey i know not everybody asks you to do it so okay it is unusual when I first, in the first week, started telling people to do that, 
part of my reasons were that I do think it's a really good technique. It is a good thing to do when you're not totally sure what's going on. But that's not my only reason. That might have confused some people into thinking that I just mean it as like a self-help strategy. It's not only that, especially on exams, it's totally a bookkeeping thing as well. It's part, it's, it's a um, presentation, pragmatic, practical matter as well. I want you guys at every step of the way to show me what the question is, because honestly, it will make, well, it'll make it so much easier and faster for me to grade fairly, to, to grade it at all and to grade it fairly. It also will force your responses to the questions to be that much more organized. So basically it's like me say, and it's just really good scientific practice. What I'm kind of saying is if you treat each little question or each little part as like a little science research presentation or paper or article or journal thing or whatever, what you're really doing is right then you're telling me the thesis statement before you go any further. You're basically telling me or the objective, whatever you wanna call it. You're saying, here's the goal of this. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to try to achieve that goal. And then when you get to the goal, i.e. the answer, you're circling it. So that makes every one of your questions a tidy little package that is super clear and organized. So it, I really do think it helps you guys. But even at this point, even if you don't think it helps, like I think it helps you with the quality of your work. But even if you don't actually believe that, the truth is it makes it much easier for me to grade. And it also, here's the deal. The important deal. for those of you who like are pretty sure you actually understand these questions anyway and and i respect that for those of you who think some of the questions are easy and you don't need all these tricks and techniques and you don't need me holding your hand and i respect that and i believe that in a lot of cases but here's the deal if you show me the question in the way that i'm saying th those of you who do already get it you're it's also going to make it so much easier to separate you from the cheaters to be honest like cheaters don't know how to do that cheaters don't do that to, and I don't want to call anybody, nobody is a cheater, but I mean, when people cheat or when they do things that I consider cheating, when they just lift answers from Chegg or something, 99% of the time, like there's all these giveaways that they're not even thinking about. And that's one of the giveaways. Someone who actually is doing the question on their own shows they know the question, works the question and then answers it. So, so I don't mean any of this is condescending. I mean, I think it's a great question that Caleb just asked, but I'm telling it, so, but I'm saying, yes, it's like one of my grading requirements and uh, hopefully that's clear. Maybe you can tell me in the chat whether that's clear or not. But I'm also going to segue this answer to one of the questions in the private chat. I mean, there's a couple of questions in the private chat. One of the questions is, um, are solutions to the practice test going to be posted or have they been posted? Fair question. Let me back up on that. So, because again, maybe some of you don't even know, a practice exam was posted yesterday. The practice exam is five long problems, your actual exam will be excerpted from that practice exam. In other words, you'll recognize if you, the more you go through that practice, anything on your actual exam is taken from that practice exam. The difference is I'll change some numbers here and there. Like I'll change some details, small details, and your actual exam will be not as long as that. Like if you can do everything on that, you can do everything on your exam. So as for that practice exam, like, so the question in private chat is like, did I, am I providing solutions or did I, or will I? Okay. And this also answers another question in private chat. I started, I, I'm going to give you, I'm giving you responses to that practice exam. What I actually already posted in, um, what I just posted in Google Classroom right before this class started. And it's called, it, it, I put it in material where I usually put the class notes. I put it there and it's, it's called something like um, uh, pre-MT uh, answers part one and two or something like that. And, and even if you didn't see it yet, or maybe someone can confirm in chat whether they see it, but even if you don't see it yet, or even if you didn't get it yet, I'm using that same document as the document that we're going to take notes on today in the class. So it, in effect, it's going to be put in your, it's going to be put in your uh, stream twice. But what, so what I've given you so far, what that is, is answers or responses, things like that, to parts, two parts, one and two of the practice exam. It's not all five parts, it's parts one and two. A couple of cautionary tales about that or cautionary statements. It's parts one and two, partly because I'm not finished, partly because I didn't want to give you everything because I want to give you a chance to still practice and look at this thing before I give you everything. Partly it's not everything because um, one of the questions in the exam, uh, part four is literally just 
homework three, which we literally went over yesterday. So you do have those. So those of you who are paying attention, you already have full responses to one out of the five questions in the exam because or one out of the five parts of the exam, because one out of the five parts, I believe it was called part. Uh, I believe it was called part four or maybe it was called part three. Um, that was just homework three, which we went over fully, yes, quickly, but fully yesterday. So, so that I, I'm considering like you have the solutions to that. Now parts one and two, I just put in the stream, just in case I don't get to talk about them, they're in the stream. Here's the deal, let me say this slowly. So in other words, in my head, and this is one of the reasons I'm rushing a little bit, in my head, the only thing in the practice the only things in the practice exam that I haven't actually given you answers for or some kind of thoughts on already really is the last two parts, four and five. They are based on homework four. So in my head, my job of today with whatever time we have, I wanna go as fully as I can on homework four, which I'm not saying is easy and I'm not saying it's not new, but I wanna dissect homework four as much as I can for you today and that will and if you're with me and you follow it and you keep the notes or you keep the, the video, then that will solve um, part four of the exam for you. I'll even, I'm not trying to play hide the ball. I'll even address it that way when I get to it, you know, momentarily. Um, and then to be super honest, then we'll get to part five today. And if we totally don't, and I don't post, then either we'll get to talking about part five today or I'll post something to help you with it. Um, but part five is like largely from lab in my, is part five is all about lab three, but, but here's my, I'm, I'm speaking too fast, but here's what I really want to say about the answers I posted. So to answer the direct, uh, chat question, I've already put in your stream answers to part one and two of the exam. They're answers. They're not solutions. In fact, I wrote that all over them. I tried to warn you, if you're paying attention, you'll see that I warn you, they are answers kind of like in the old days when you have a textbook and you have homework questions and you can look up the odd numbered questions in the back of the book and find the answers. It's like in that spirit. Like, I mean, in some places I did a lot of work, but in some places I did very little work. I'm giving you answers, responses, and some fragments of work so that you can make sure you're on track, that you understand the exam. Like, so if you're trying it on your own, you can see if you're right or wrong or you have something to discuss with your friends, or you can make sure you're finding the same thing that I'm looking for. I did not write out full solutions, especially not to part one, because part one I think is incredibly like all the homework that we've been going over day after day for weeks now. So what I, so I give you the answers so you can make sure you get, that you have the right answers and that you're not crazy and all that. But I wanna warn everybody, like, one of the tricky things about me giving you solutions to practice exams is my solutions at this point or my answers are to help. They're not a contract. Like don't copy. If you copy my answers directly back to me and submit it as your exam, you're making a big mistake. Number one, because you might, some people would think that's cheating, but no, number two, because I'm not giving you the full solutions. I'm giving you my thoughts to help you your job is to give me to, to work through a full solution based on that. And anybody who's been trying with the homework, anybody who did homework one and homework two, or at least tried or paid attention in class, I really think at this point knows what it is I'm looking for. But so, all right, I'm talking a lot. What I'm saying is, right, as of this moment, I think you guys have fragmentary, anywhere from fragmentary to full thoughts on part one, part two, and part three of this practice exam. I think my job today is to talk you through part four and to some extent part five. And, and then and then it's your job to study and you know and look through all that stuff. And then it'll be posted tomorrow night. And again, you totally can have your practice exam out in front of you. And you can have all of my notes and all my thoughts out in front of you when you get the real thing. I'm trying to give you everything I can to help you get it. But in the end, you show me that you get it. Um, all right, wait, there's other things in the, and I don't know, oh, wait, sorry. Okay, let me just get the other things in the chat and if there are other, and the, again, if I'm yelling, these are all very fair questions. And by the way, they're all very fair questions. Even questions that I'm getting at right now that even if some of you might think that they've been asked before, they're totally fair to ask right now. That is what 
today is for. If I sound intense, it's just because I'm concerned about time, basically. But this, if you're worried, you should be asking a question right now, whether it's in the chat or not. Because the thing I'm trying to avoid is someone doing something totally wrong at the last minute and not like when it's too late to ask a question and then complaining that they didn't know or something like that. Okay, so when in doubt, all of you, please watch a YouTube video or something to make sure you know what I'm expecting, but you still can keep asking questions all today. You definitely can. Now, let me look in the chat. But, oh, and Caleb, is your hand still, or, um, are you cool? You're, I think your hand is technically still up, but I don't know. Wait, hold on, let me just. Sorry, I'll get back to the chat. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now after I complete my thing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. One question in the chat. That's totally fair. It's not super important to this exam, but it's important. Um, I put in this thing called a glitch catcher portal and someone's asking about it. I did actually kind of explain it yesterday in the, and you can watch the YouTube video, but the fast answer on the glitch catcher portal is, and it, it's not really important because honestly I made it for one specific circumstance thus far and it didn't even work for that circumstance. So probably most of you are gonna end up ignoring it. But the glitch catcher portal was meant to be, if for some reason there's points that we both agree that I owe you, that I'm not being able to get back to you, any of you. If for some reason one of your documents is not uploading, but I see, or if for whatever reason, in some case, I keep telling you, yes, I totally approve your work and I totally owe you 75 points, but the system's not letting me give you those points. That's what the glitch catcher portal is meant for but this has only come up so far with one person and the glitch catcher portal didn't even solve the problem. So actually until, until it comes up again, don't even worry about the glitch catcher portal. It, it, if I, if I have a personal dialogue with you about one of your homeworks and I refer to it, then you'll know. But other than that, it, it doesn't apply to anybody. So don't, don't worry. It totally does not have to do with the exam. I can promise you that. Um, all right. Our, so, oh, and then the same person who asked that asked, could I explain what was just uploaded? What was just uploaded is what I said. It was my notes, responses, sketched out quick answers to parts one and two of the practice exam, just parts one and two. I will also try to upload other things, or, but I'll give you other things in the notes today. And the notes that we do today are on that same document. So that, that's what that is. Um, our solution, oh no, I asked that and sometimes wrong. Okay, Catherine's thing I think is either, I'm not sure I get it. It might be very funny. Uh, from I'm, Chad, the answers oh. were wrong. Oh, oh, that is funny. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> and boy, people, I mean, oh my God. If I'm not careful, I could go five hours on Chad. Like to, and let me say again though to anybody, I have to be so careful about this. I love Khan Academy, okay? This is not me being, this is not me thinking that the only way you can learn physics is from me, not at all. I'm a horrible way to learn physics for some people. For some people, I'm here just to show you what is on the exam and then you're gonna have to go learn it other ways like Khan Academy or three brown, one blue. I'm all for all of that, but yeah, Chegg, ooh, just be super careful with Chegg people, right? Like, like Catherine's saying, honestly, the answers are sometimes wrong and they really, it's just, it's the wrong, anyway, whatever, yeah. Um, okay, okay. Um, no, no, right. Now, there's a very polite question in the private chat. It is polite that it's in the private. And I tried to address this also came up a couple weeks ago. Someone very politely is that I totally dropped the ball on the midterms last semester for, for in this, not in the other class. In 204, was, for whatever reason, last semester, there were two big sections of 204 and believe me, they all got their midterms back and their finals back and their midterms, they got back in super detail. Some of them probably regretted that they got them back because the grades were like, they averaged like a 61 and a 64 in those two big sections. I, but I mentioned that already. That's not to scare anybody, it's just the reality. They were graded with high scrutiny. I totally, a number of things happened and I totally dropped the ball in 203 last semester. I'm admitting that again, and I'm totally ashamed but the midterms never came back in a time to help anybody. It was a complete failure on my part and no student's part. And I tried to make up with it for it with all these other generous things later on. But so it's reasonable that some of the students in this room who had me for 203 last semester have a reasonable concern, like, are we actually getting these things back? But the answer is yes. 
Okay, it's very fair for you to ask. It's very fair for you to be worried because of your experience last semester, but that was a weird experience. It didn't happen in the other two classes. I can't justify it or explain it, but it won't happen here. Like, unless I you know, get into a truck accident or something, you should assume that you will get your exams back. I, um, I don't know how fast, but you will. And you'll get them back in some detail. Again, if you talk to the people that took 204 last semester, boy, did they get theirs. Like, I think some of them wish they did it. But yeah, fair question. But yes, you will get them back. Um, um, uh, okay, now on Trunkia's question, also very fair. And I appreciate that she went public with it. Like, wait. <laughs> Sorry, okay, that's funny direct chat person. who, And thank you for direct chat person who asked me the question about getting them back. You totally did close the circle on that. And I appreciate it. So you totally get points for that. But now, Okay, Shankia and, Ka oh, and Catherine, I totally, that's hilarious. And yeah, again, I, I can be a real jerk about Chegg. I just want everybody to know it's specifically, and look, part of the reason I'm a jerk about Chegg is because they charge you guys money. I mean, I think it's a real, I think it's, and they make money off other people's work. Like I've, I mean, but, but, con but it's not that I think that you can't learn from the web. I mean, in fact, honestly, part of the reason that I do all this YouTube stuff now in Google Classroom, like this is the way the world is now. And I feel like I have to compete with the, I think Khan Academy forces me to be a better teacher. Or, I mean, forces me to try to be a better teacher. I'm all for Khan Academy and all for all those resources. And I'm, and I'm for you sitting down and literally using them while you take my exam, like no joke. And now this goes to Shankia's question. Let me be as clear as I can about this, as I can, which is, no, you can use my work to do your exam. Like if you have my solutions right next to you while you're doing my exam, all the power to you. That just means we're both getting our money's worth out of it. Like that means I'm not wasting my time and you're not wasting your tuition, right? Like you, you should, you can use my work. And there's some level at which, you know, physics is physics and math is math. Like, of course, some of the things I write down, you're gonna write down too. And don't be ashamed of that. What I'm really saying is, I know the difference between you blindly copying what I do versus you using what I'm doing to m get you to understand it. Like basically what you do should never just be what I do. That, that's kind of what I'm saying. It should, of course, it should resemble what I do. And there will be a lot of lines that are identical to what I do. But the way to know if that sounds, and I, and I think honestly in everybody's heart, they know, they know the, di I think you all know the difference between when you're writing something you get versus when you're copying something down that you don't get. And, and right there, that's actually the difference. You can literally look at my solutions while you're taking this exam. But one way to just to test yourself to make sure that you're giving me a good exam is like, look at my solutions and then turn away and then see if you can write them down without looking, like whether it's on a rough draft or on the final draft. It's just like for your own heart and your own mind. If you look at my solutions and it's five lines long, now see if you can write those five lines without literally looking while you're writing. Chances are, if you can write and ask yourself while you're writing them, are they just blind? Did you just, was it just a poem that you just memorized? Like, or do you get what you're writing? You really will know the difference. Particularly if you can't write it without looking every moment, then you know you don't really get it, right? I mean, so you, even though this is not a test in memorization, one easy way to know whether you get it is look at my stuff as much as you want. But then when you're writing, be trying to look somewhere else. And the more you can add in between my steps, every time you think you get something, it's because it clicks, it's because it connects something. The more you can add, or the more you can change color, or the more, you know, or things like that, the better. I mean, and I'll, the most, and it is a judgment call. It's all a judgment call, just like writing an essay in English or, you know, a research paper in history. Ultimately, there are judgment calls, both for the writer and for the grader. But I'll say this too. If you're going to copy from anything, if you're going to use anything as a guide, I certainly, this is mostly to Shankia's question, but it's a very good one. I'll say this to all of you. Um, if you're going to use anything as a basic guide to what you're doing, oh, definitely use my stuff first and foremost. And that's not like just an ego trip. That is, that's the point of the class. Like if you're going to have a main reference manual to what you're trying to do, first, your first go-to should be my notes and all that. And then your job is to try to make those notes as clear to yourself as you can. But if you were to fall back on anything, and if anywhere you're a little insecure and you're just sort of like accepting some things on faith, it would be better to accept my stuff on faith than Chegg's. And really, because like, no, I, I, 
I hope that sort of makes sense. And, you know, I know nobody's going to know this stuff perfectly. It's the first time around for a lot of us. I totally get that. I'm just saying whenever you do get it, really strut your stuff and show that. Um, and you can also be honest. If you ever write down a line that you really are like, I just don't even know what this line means. Well, the ideal is to now go on the web and research what that line means or the symbols in it. But if it really, if everything else makes sense to you and there's one line you really don't get, oh, I would applaud someone if they wrote a whole bunch of stuff and it all made sense, but they had this one line that they knew was right because it kept appearing in my notes, but they could not penetrate it and they talked to their friends and they still don't get it, but it's like one line. If that person like drew an arrow to that line was like, this honestly is still incomprehensible to me. Oh, that would, that would not lower your grade. That would only endear you. That would just make your whole thing that much more honest and presentable and higher grade. I mean, of course, if every line you say that, you know, that's a problem. But it is about honest communication of the thoughts. It really is. Um, um, so, I mean, what, you know, what does happen sometimes is people will just copy things from Chegg and Chegg uses totally different symbols. And then I, I, then I know like, oh my God, are you kidding? Like you haven't even bother to look at our homework solutions yet or blah, blah, blah. But no, no to Shakia, to Shoshanki and everybody else, um, another way to put it is my feelings about cheating are unusual, I know, or our physics feelings about cheating. I mean, I know Joe Walters, it's, we have the same philosophy and all that. Maybe it's unusual, maybe. But in the end of the day, one aspect of my feeling about cheating is almost never, almost never do I come out and say to a person, I believe you got this line from somewhere else. Therefore, that is cheating. Therefore, I'm not only deducting points, but like I'm taking you in front of judicial review board or something like that. I mean, I think I've in my whole life and I've been right. I've been teaching like 27, 28 years in my whole life. I think I've done that twice. Maybe um, I don't do that. If I think you got something from somewhere else, I don't write. I think you got this from somewhere else. Therefore, you lose points. No. Because everything is from somewhere else, ultimately, whether it's me, like everything, there's no original thought in this world. My point is to you guys, once we're saying it's open resource and open everything, I'm telling you that if you just grab your thoughts from somewhere else, they're going to degenerate and become bad thoughts faster than you'll ever realize. I don't have to accuse anybody of cheating. I'm just telling you there's a difference between good physics and bad physics. And if you're, and even though I think my physics is good, anybody who just tries to lift my physics directly and put it on their paper and call it there, it's going to become bad physics in their hands, just like a bad translation to a language that you don't know. So no, so I, I know I'm yelling and screaming about this. I really want to reassure Shanky and anybody else. Look, let me be really frank. I like Shankia's question. I also like Cable, uh, Caleb's question. I mean, I like everybody's question. But Shankia, I know she's been in this class. Let me just be super blunt. She's been here every day. Like, I use her name like once every 20 minutes. And I don't mean it to make anybody else feel bad, but we all know that I do. She's raised like at least three se severe, serious, substantive questions. And not once has she pretended that she knows things she doesn't know. She's legitimately trying to get them. I don't know exactly how much she knows or she doesn't, but I know she's been legitimately engaging, participating in this class. And I've seen all her homework and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm saying this totally as a compliment. And it's just an example. She's definitely not the only one by any means. But I know for a fact already that when Shankia asks, wait, are we allowed to like use your stuff for, you know, our, I know she's not looking for how to cheat. She's looking to make sure she doesn't accidentally do something that I consider cheating. I know that's why she's asking the question. I mean, I would say that in front of like a court of law, whatever, and I've never met her. Like, I believe she's in good faith. And so I want to make sure that she and everybody else in this room who's in good faith, no, you should definitely use my stuff. Like that's what you're here for, but use it to learn the way she's been doing every day. Use it to learn, use it to try to guide you to understanding. Don't use it as the final word, as just a piece of text that you're just gonna copy and give back to me. Cause I know my own stuff too well. I'll reckon, I'll, you know, I mean, I hope, and that's a, that's a subtle thing I'm saying, but just in the end, I think everybody knows the difference. Write down on paper things you don't understand. Show me how much you understand. Don't write things that you don't understand. Take from tonight and, and Thursday night all the way to Monday to do everything in your power to achieve understanding, which means using each other, which means blah, blah, blah. I, I hope, okay. I, and anybody who's in good faith, really, and gives me a bunch of physics will do well in the class. But really, I, I think mostly. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Wait, wait. Right. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Oh, oh cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Shakia. I appreciate you. Appreciate it. Well, 
Okay, wait. And will I? Yeah. So I've been, and so I, there's a question in the direct chat. Will I upload solutions? Yeah. And I already have some, and I've been talking about that, but yes. So yes. Um, and then uh, something in the direct chat. Wait. Right. Everything I give you is, yeah. So this says in the direct chat, someone wrote, so everything we use is as a guide to help get us the answers. That's right. And, and some of my guides are more, like, like some of my guides are, are, are really very thorough and detailed like the ones on homework one and homework two. I think what I did there, if I literally asked those questions on the exam, pretty much I've done it all out for you. And, you know, it would be hard to do something very, very different from what I did there. But that's why the exam is not literally those questions, if that makes any sense. But yes, um, but what if the way, right. I, I, and this is the subtle point and I'll try to move off this in a second, but I do see this in the private chat, someone, and by the way, let me say, and this is almost always true. The people who are in the private chat right now that I'm answering their questions, because they're private, I'm not mentioning their names. And sometimes I'm saying the question, but I know who's in the private chat, right? Like, I mean, even if you don't, I do. And I'm going to say, all right, here's a question in the private chat. What if the way we understand is the way that I did it, like the way the algorithm did it? Now, I'm going to tell you all right now, again, the person who wrote that, I also know who it is. I know his or her homework. I know the other kind of questions that he or she asks, mostly in the private chat. I believe very strongly that person is also in good faith. Like, I believe that person is not looking for loopholes. I believe that person's looking to make sure like that they don't accidentally you know, do the wrong thing or whatever. And I believe they're legitimately saying like, wait, this is kind of confusing. Like, hang on. You're saying like, if we get what you've done now, then can we do it your way? And won't that be okay? And, and yes, so um, let me say again to everybody, and I'm, and I'm yelling at you because I know this is kind of new to you all. It has taken me 27 years to develop this philosophy, honestly. Like, it's not the way I taught in the beginning, and it's not the way a lot of other people teach, but, but it, it does make sense once you get used to it. What I'm saying to that person in direct chat and everybody, let, let's, if you really get what's going on in this class so far, and a good test is like, if you feel like now you understand homework two and homework one, you might not have before, but if you do now, Right. And if I gave you a test that literally was homework two or, or even better, like homework three, because I pretty much did go over it yesterday. Right. I believe that many of you are like, oh, I get what Yaverbaum did. And that's pretty much what I would now do on the exam. So what is he yelling about? Like, can't I just do pretty much what Yaverbaum did on the exam? Here's the deal. If you can do it without looking, if you look at what I did and then you and of course, I won't be in your room when this happens. But if you look at what I did and then you turn away. And then you sit down at the exam and you do it the way I did it, but you do it without looking. Then I promise you two things. One, yes, you, that means you understand what I did. And now it's in your brain. It's not just mine. It's yours as well. And that's legit. And you learned it from me, but now it is in your possession. And now you're putting it on the exam. And if you're doing it without looking, not only do I promise you that that is legitimate and okay, but I'll bet you, if you really don't look, at that moment, and you can practice a couple times or do a rough draft, but if you, if it's a few lines and you see what I did and now you're doing it without looking, I promise you, it will look different enough to me. It will be subtly distinct enough to me that I will know that you wrote it, not me. That you have to maybe just believe me on that. But this again, any of you who speaks more than one language or any of you who plays a musical instrument knows what I'm talking about, right? Like if you play a musical instrument, okay, like you can, you, if you play the piano, you can teach me a piece note by note. And I could like kill myself for months to learn every note of that piece. But if I come and try to play out every one of those notes of that piece, you'll know whether it's music or not, right? You'll be able to tell that I'm just like plunking out the notes if that's all I'm doing versus if I actually became a player and could actually bring music to it, right? Or similarly, if you speak of two languages, you know when someone's just like, like eking out word, by word, by word, and saying it in a terrible accent or whatever, versus someone who actually gets language. I am arrogantly telling you all that at this point in my physics career, I know even if uh, even if one line of an equation, even if we both do it the same way, I can tell the difference with someone who's writing it from comprehension versus someone who's copying it symbol for symbol. I just can't. I mean, and I think you and your heart know that too. So I'm saying that again to encourage the person who wrote in the private chat. I know who the person is. I, I'm pretty sure it is a good person. I mean, nobody's perfect, obviously. I'm not saying she or he never like shoplifted when they were in fourth grade or something, but I'm saying 
the person who asked in the private chat, wait, what if we do it the way you do it? If you actually do it the way I do it, rather than just copying my doing it, you'll be fine and I'll know you're fine and we'll both be fine. We're all just saying, don't check it up. That's really, okay. I mean, and, and also it's like, you know, if someone's just learned, well, yeah, you get, it. I think y'all get it. Um, okay, 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 okay. Oh, cool. Oh, okay, cool, cool. And thank you. All right. That's a full circle thing too. I appreciate it. Okay. We can have it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> to, I wouldn't go so crazy on this, except if you can all tell. I, first of all, I hate exams as much as you'd believe me. And I hate grading them as much as you hate, well, almost as much as you think. But also like, I mean, I, I hate the way school normally goes. I don't know if you go all notice this. I'm sincere about all this. I think school should be very different from the way that we normally approach it. And I've been in just enough schools. I've seen some schools work very differently from the way they usually work. And like, it can be done. People can be much more humane about all of this. And the truth is the more humane we all are, the more we can get actually to super hard stuff that's actually hard on its own merits rather than hard for all the BSE reasons that we all invent to make things hard. But so whatever. So in a way, this whole discussion is, you know, if I'm not careful, we could just have a two and a half hour discussion about this philosophy. And then I'll just have to give you grades for that. But, but Catherine's point in the public chat, wait, we can have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like, like, totally to oh sorry i should read it out loud i guess but catherine says in the public chat we can add written explanations for questions that do not require it question mark in order to basically let you me know where we get confused if we do not know how to answer the whole problem question mark yes like so yes like really what i'm saying to all of you is the more you can explain anything anywhere everywhere the better like in some ways really i'm saying all questions require it i mean all questions require it, but yes this is an opportunity. I mean, you know, think of each question, each little physical question as more of a prompt, if you like, for you to demonstrate to me the totality of your command of these concepts. The more you can give me to show me that, the better. When you really get it, then the more you extra detail you can add, like a graphical picture or an extra diagram or an extra color, great. And when you don't understand, the more you can honestly show me the difference between what you do understand and what you don't, the better. Maybe that's the last way I could put it for everybody because I do get that no one's going to know this perfectly. And I also get that sometimes you think you know it when you don't and vice versa. But the more throughout the exam, you can show me the difference between your clear acute comprehension and your fuzzy comprehension, the more you can be honest about that, oh my God, like that's even better. It's again, it's not, I mean, yes, you have to get answers right to, you know, to get credit a lot of times, but, but yeah. So yes, the more you can give, and that's why you have all these days to do it. And again, you can work with each other and all that. Yes, the more you can give me, the more clarity, um, the more explanation, the more, the, the better. Absolutely. Um, okay, okay. Okay, blah, blah. okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, um, okay. Uh, let me just get, I think, oh, did I get, I think that's every, I think that's all the questions. Um, sorry. Yeah. So you could still keep asking questions during the class, obviously. Again, when you're in doubt, if you want more instructions or whatever, look at the instructions in the Google Classroom posting for the practice exam. When in doubt, it's all about the practice exam. I mean, you know, if you if you know the insides and outs of the practice exam, then you're set. There's no question about that. And there's nothing else but that. Um, all right, which means I think, yeah, I want to catch my breath, but I think what I want to do now, I want to go to homework four, because if I can, what time is it? I want to go to homework four, which will seem like a totally new concept. It will. And, it, you know, this is the sense in which the course does sort of move fast now. And I apologize for that. I mean, it's summer, blah, blah, blah. But homework four at the beginning will seem like a totally different concept. It is all covered in one big, I mean, ultimately homework four is relevant because if we can get fast enough to homework four, it is all captured in part four. I believe it's part four of this exam. Um, and I and I believe really that's like the last stone left unturned in all of this. Two fifteen, yeah. Okay. So oh, let me look in the chat again. But so that's what. So I'm going to turn to homework four in a moment. Oh oh oh, sorry. That was a question I missed. 
a question in the direct chat. How long should it take to take the exam in one sitting? That's a very fair question. And of course that would differ from person to person. And legally you could take as long as you like, but how long should it take? Like how long would I expect? By the time I give you the real exam, which again, you'll be responsible for three problems. You might have a choice. Like it might be definitely do problem one and then choose problem two or three or something like that. But you'll have to do three full problems for the actual exam. I would say that under normal circumstances, I mean, these exams are meant to be like two hour exams under normal, like, you know, if we were in a regular physics class, not in COVID, not on the web, not in the middle of the it would be like a two hour exam. But I think that's a little pushing it for, I would say, you know, and for me to do out the solutions to it would take about an hour or something. So I, I think re more realistically for those of you, I think if you're really trying to do this, under test conditions, and you had already practiced with the practice exam, and you'd already looked through the practice exam, and blah, blah, blah. When you sat down to do the actual exam, I would think it'd be like a three hour experience. In, but that's under super ideal, you know, like you're totally on your game and you're not doing anything else with your life, and blah, blah, blah. I don't actually, I think it should take longer for most people, really. Um, and I hope you do take longer because I'm, you know, it would take three hours to just like bang out the solutions in sort of a customary way. Um, yeah, it's like a three hour exam, but I would actually expect and hope that most of you would take longer. And I would encourage you to do scratch notes and draft documents and stuff, none of which you should hand in, but okay. So that's to answer that. All right, let me, I'm gonna, so we're gonna go to homework four now. So I'm gonna take a breath for a second. Um, So homework four, so homework four. Okay. Okay. So I'm back. So I'm transitioning. It's two twenty. Again, I you know more questions about the exam may come up between now and four. I totally welcome them. Uh, and again, as we get closer to three or four. I will try to more directly be talking about the exam again. Like I promise that everything I'm about to do right now, I totally promise that what I'm about to do is go over homework four. Oh, by the way, I also know that some of you haven't done it and some of you have, it doesn't, fine. It doesn't matter. I'm about to talk about homework four. It is a totally different topic. You'll, you'll, it's not an accident and it's not to be cruel. It's just, it's a different topic or at least it begins as a different topic. I promise you that by the time we get to the end of this sheet of homework four, you'll see how it will totally help you with the exam and I will directly relate it to the problem in the practice exam. I think I can also explicitly tell you right now, if this makes it easier. Um, you know, if you're looking, if you have the practice exam out in front of you right now, uh, hopefully you'll see what I mean that part four of it, I believe it's part four, problem four, whatever you call it, all has to do with gravity, which this homework four has to do with. They don't look like the same problem. You'll see how they're connecting the end. But I can promise you this, the, due to time constraints, et cetera, the way the gravity problem looks in the practice exam, that will be exactly the way it looks in your, in your actual exam. Like the only question in your mind is whether I'm forcing you to do it or not. Like maybe you might not do it, although I think you will. Um, but I can promise you it will be that problem. So everything I'm going to say here about this homework four will, will help you with that. Then I will try to directly map it onto that. I will, but just know that like everything we're talking about now is about ultimately part four of your practice exam. Again, I'm believing that I've given you a bunch of documentation or help with parts one, two, and three already. So kind of my big thrust here is part four. Um, okay. I just, I'm just, again, I'm just trying to be as clear as possible.
because I know I'm not. All right, so I'm looking at, so I'm looking at part four, or uh, homework four. I'm on a blank sheet of the board. <laughs> you could, I have to, you could see, I mean, exams stress me out. I hate exams. Can you tell? I mean, Lordy, and, I, and I, mostly out of empathy for you, believe me. I, anyway, whatever. Okay. Um, but you should be proud if you've even gotten to this class and you should be proud when you get through this class and you'll know something when you do. I'll tell you that. All right, homework four. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna start by saying, I mean, we're gonna do the math of homework for, you know, momentarily, we're gonna do the numbers and all that, or the letters. L let me back up and give you context for this. We are shifting gears here. Like the notes said gravitational gear, whatever. Homework four is a gear shift. The gears come together and I will explain why these topics have anything to do with each other and why they're in this course. But, you know, for all this time, we've been doing simple harmonic oscillation. We've been just looking at how systems vibrate basically. Now we're about to totally shift gears and we're about to look at how systems interact with each other. Okay. It's sort of a different thing. We're going to put the two together ultimately to end up with the, with the, ultimately the world of electricity, magnetism, and light, believe it or not, even though time is flying, but, um, uh, but they, um, oh, to be more specific, what this whole course, I, I didn't even really spend time saying this on the first day, but, Physics 2, physics 204 is still physics, right? All of you had a first course in physics, whether it was with me or with someone else, whether it was a good experience or a bad experience. What all of you learned about in physics 1 or in physics 203, you all learned ultimately um, about uh, things moving through time and space. That is ultimately what physics is always, 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 always about. It's about stuff moving through time and space. More specifically, what physics is always about is if you uh, identify a piece of stuff and you name a certain point in time and a certain point in space, you can ask me, sorry, I'm, I'm being incoherent. Physics is all about saying, where will something be when? It's all about predicting what point in space some point of mass will be at a certain point in time. Like literally, that is what physics is always about. In fact, that's why the whole thing can be um, understood or measured through the MKS system that you all, or the SI system of units that you're all familiar with from back in the day. Why everything comes down to kilograms, meters, and seconds is because everything in physics really does come down to just stuff in time and space. That's the whole arena of physics. Now, in the first course of physics, you learn the, pr the principles and the practices of doing that. You learn the laws and the relations, the methods of making predictions about where things will be when. Okay, that's what, I mean, whether you liked it or not, whether it went well or not, that's what physics 203 classical mechanics is supposed to be. This is still physics. Everything we're doing, even all this harmonic oscillation, all these math things that maybe look weird, it's still 100% physics in that we're still interested in stuff in time and space. The difference between physics 203 and physics 204 is indeed physics 204 gets a lot more mathy, but why? 
because even though we're still 100% interested in where stuff will be in time and space or where stuff will be when, and even though we're ultimately interested in the same practices and the same principles, i.e. the same laws, the same equations, what we're, the, the, the gear shift now is that we're interested in a different type of stuff. The fundamental distinction between physics 203 and physics 204, or the fundamental distinction between classical mechanics, Galilean and Newtonian physics, and the physics that comes later, is that we're interested now in different types of entities that are moving through time and space. We used to only be interested in macroscopic, palpable, tangible, uh, feelable, relatable items of mass, of stuff, like baseballs or cars or rocket ships or even tiny things like electrons sometimes sort of now ultimately what physics becomes interested in is more abstract less tangible more ethereal but nonetheless very real and existent entities ultimately such as ripples sound heat electricity magnet magnetic fields light we're ultimately interested in things moving that are very unthingy now that's what we're ultimately trying to study in physics 204 and beyond we're trying to study things that do exist but aren't as thingy as they were in 203 aren't things that aren't as palpable or tangible or material or massive or whatever the way we get at that so ultimately what we're interested in is like electrical fields magnetic fields and light waves that and we get there the way we're ultimately interested in these ethereal abstract entities that totally do exist and totally do move through time and space according to the principles and practices of physics. The way we understand these entities, the way we believe in them and the way we track them is we ultimately see them as, um, as consisting of a bunch of complicated oscillations and interactions. Okay, we're ultimately looking at entities that are systems consisting of oscillations and interactions. I, that may or may not make sense to you yet, but basically, especially if you're starting to get to this in lab three and lab four in the lab, if you're starting to get to the motion of waves, right? Waves are the big transition here, a way, and that's where we're ultimately trying to get, to study the motion of a wave, a wave pulse is to study the motion of something that totally exists, that totally predictably moves through, measurably and predictably moves through time and space, but isn't tangible, isn't palpable, isn't material in the way that a baseball is, right? And what we're ultimately gonna say, the way we understand waves and fields and radiations and heats and all these things is that what they are, are they are not particles, they are not objects, they are systems uh, that uh, of a bunch and bunch and bunch of huge numbers of particles that are all oscillating and interacting with each other in such a special way that they make these abstract entities called, for example, sound waves or called, for example, heat waves or called, for example, electrical fields. Okay. I mean, that's a quick sort of back. So what I'm trying to say is what we are trying to build up in physics 204 with all this math and with all this understanding, we're trying to build up an understanding of oscillation and interaction such that we can study immaterial moving entities. That's like the context, okay? So what we've been doing for two and a half weeks is oscillation. Now we're gonna shift our gears and look at interaction. We're gonna look at how particles, how points of mass actually affect each other through empty space and the fundamental Professor, is, sorry, is your is, is your screen supposed to be black sorry uh, sorry go caleb sorry is your screen supposed to be black sorry i can't say say it again sorry is your, is your screen supposed to be black oh uh no wait uh thank you wait my screen is black you mean my oh it, no it's not supposed to be hang on so you you're mean I, I can see i can see the one i can see the one with your face but the one that you're sharing is black for me is anybody else black oh no all right no thank you that's okay maybe i'm the only one because my alarm went off Wait, no but i'm glad time. you're no because things like that do happen wait so uh oh okay wait is it still black for you though yeah it's only me i guess hold on i'll leave oh, her address okay sorry uh, but no thanks for um okay 
No, I appreciate it. Oh, but you do, okay, but thank you, Antonio, and thank you, direct chairperson, and thank you, Shankir. Also, quick question, okay, as long as it, so, all right, but I'm glad you're still paying attention, and I, and I will go back to this homework. So, well, all of that is to say, we're about to study gravity, we're about to study gravity, which technically is an old idea from Newton. I mean, technically could have come up in physics 203, but might not have, depending on who your professor is or whether it was me. I'm going to introduce it right now. But just again, so you know the context, we're about to look at how two objects affect each other through empty space. If we put that idea together with the oscillation idea, we'll have waves and fields and all these other abstract things. So that's the context. But one other quick question, as long as Caleb just asked that, I noticed last night, this is not like an opportunity for, but when you guys, anybody who's ever checked out even one minute of the YouTube videos, does the sound come through? Because I was checking one out last night and no sound was coming. Does the, can anybody verify that sound ever is coming through in the YouTube videos? Is there, and if you can't, you can't, it's okay, but. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, it is? Okay, okay, all right, thank you. All right, that's all, you know. okay, all right, cool. All right, so I'm gonna go back to this now. So this homework four assumes that we know something that I'm gonna say now. We, it assumes that we know from Newton, uh, from, the, from Newton's Principia, uh, Newton was born in 1642, he died in 1727, he wrote the Principia in around 1690, I forget. Um, in the Principia, Newton wrote this equation that many of you have seen in many contexts, and I don't want to make it overly complicated, but he wrote this equation, and, and it's totally look upable on the web, and it's totally in the equation sheet of our exam, whatever. He wrote this equation that looks something like this, or at least in this form right here. Okay, the idea here, and this idea can be as simple or as infinitely complex as we want to treat it as, but the idea here, and it is a leap, it's a statement that I, that's inferred from a bunch of astronomical measurements and, and some big conjectures and leaps of faith. Um, it's a statement that we would have no reason to believe at all. We certainly would have no reason for just logically assuming or inferring, and we'd have no reason for b believing even, except that it experimentally time and time and time and time again seems to work. It seems to turn out to be true um, uh, regarding measurements that we make uh, to verify it. The statement is, the statement is that you, if you have any two point masses in the universe at all, any, in other words, any two bits of mass, uh, any two bits of arbitrary mass, so like a big mass and a small mass, but, but when I say point masses, I mean, any two amounts of mass that take up a very negligible amount of volume, right? So you could have a, a really dense piece of say gold, that's you know a tiny grain, but has a mass of like three kilograms. And then you could have a very undense piece of, of, of cotton, which also takes up just about the same amount of space, but only has like 0.5 kilograms of mass to it, right? If you picture any two shrunken down small dots of material, According to Newton, these two bits of mass will automatically pull on each other. Each one will exert a force of attraction on the other automatically just by virtue of them existing, right? Um, and so they won't have to do anything in order to pull on each other and they won't have to be in any kind of physical contact in order to pull on each other. And in fact, even if there is stuff in between them, like a sheet or a table or a planet, whether there's nothing in between them or something in between them, any and every pair of mass points that you can imagine automatically 
pull on each other with a number of newtons that is directly proportional to how massive each one of them is and is inversely proportional to the square of how far away they are. Okay, that's what the statement, that, that, that's what this mathematical statement means. In other words, we still believe we. Sorry. Like this law comes after Newton's three laws of motion. We already, this assumes we already kind of understand how motion works, like from physics one or from the, you know, the beginning of Newton's work. We still, we already have a notion of how forces- But Patrick, work. can you go to the previous page one second? Sorry, yeah, absolutely, sorry, yeah. So, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, oh yeah, uh, and sorry, um, direct chat person who also- Okay, asked. sorry, you can go to the next page. Okay, uh, no problem, okay. Okay, sorry, sorry, to both of you. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so what I'm saying in English right now, and again, some of you have heard this a million times, some of you have heard this in high school or junior high, some of you heard this in physics one last semester, some of you didn't, okay, cool, cool. Um, what I'm saying in English is that every bit of mass automatically exerts a force on every other bit of mass in the whole universe. And the force that it exerts then acts like all other forces, like it contributes to free body diagrams and to the left side of F net equals MA, it contributes to acceleration. So this is kind of like a Hooke's law. This is a law. This is kind of like Hooke's law. It's a specific description of a specific force. It's not changing our definition of force or saying the forces do anything different. It's saying just like the elasticity in a coil in a spring works a certain way, there's a universal attraction among objects that just seems to be there as a force that then does what forces always do, it accelerates. Now, this is a huge claim. I mean, it, it, this is called a, you know, the universal law of gravitation or the law of universal gravitation. Um, it is a big deal because if you really, and, and we don't have tons of time now, but if you really are hearing what I'm saying, whether it's the first time you've heard it or not, it is a bizarre thing to say. I am like normally up until this point, when you think of for, sorry, let me say, forces are always pulls or pushes. To exert a force on something, you always need two objects. Like I exert a force on you, or a baseball bat exerts a force on a baseball, or a baseball exerts a force on a baseball bat. But a force is always an interaction between two objects. It's always a push or a pull. It's something that one object does to another. Like that's always true of forces, okay? And then the uh, uh, consequence of them is ultimately acceleration. But forces are always that sort of thing. The thing is that generally when we're picturing forces in our minds, generally it's easiest to picture contact. If I wanna think of me pulling a fish up out of the ocean, what I generally picture is a fishing line, like a string that touches the fish and then exerts tension and yanks up the fish by actually touching it. A lot of forces macroscopically work that way. A lot of forces seem to work that way, that they work by contact. What I'm claiming to you now, or what Newton is claiming to you, claimed to you, is that some forces in the world just exist. Some objects, can, uh, there's certain ways in which objects pull on each other just because they're there. And this is one of them. Gravitation is a, 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 an act that is automatically performed by every single mass in the whole universe. In other words, the whole universe is all pulling on itself all the time, according to this claim. If again, you'll know you're hearing me and you'll know you're sort of understanding this claim if part of your brain doesn't like it. If part of you is like, wait, what, really? Like, wait, are you actually saying like right now? Like I'm saying right now, like my fingernail is automatically pulling on some piece of dust in the Andromeda galaxy right now. And also my fingernail is automatically right now via gravitation pulling on like Bill Clinton's like left earlobe. Like it is, and Bill Clinton's left earlobe is pulling on my fingernail. I am saying that. Now I'm all, I, now I'm saying a very small amount. We'll get like the math of this tells us by what amount. So some gravitational forces are a lot smaller than others. And I am saying here that the gravitational force that exists between any and every two masses is directly proportional to the mass, number one. So in order to have a lot of gravitational pull, you gotta have a lot of mass. I'm also saying, according to this 
law or this mathematical equation that the farther away two things are, the bigger the R. So, so R, is, R stands for displacement between the objects and it's measured in meters. R is in the denominator of this equation. So this equation is saying the bigger either of the masses, the bigger the force, because the masses are in the numerator, but the R is in the denominator and it's even squared. So it's saying, if you want to look at how hard like my fingernail is pulling on Bill Clinton's like left earlobe or whatever, um, you know, for ask yourself how many meters there are between my fingernail and Bill Clinton's earlobe, square that and then put it in the denominator of a fraction. So the bigger and bigger that distance gets, the smaller and smaller this is force is going to be. Now, then it's saying then whatever you get when you do this calculation. And again, this is a weird, I mean, you would have no reason to believe this, this law. It, I'm not saying it's logical. I'm saying, and in fact, a lot of people at the time that Newton came out with it did not think it was logical, but it works. Like every prediction it makes numerically seems to work out. It gets, it's verified scientifically time after time or experimentally, um, which is one thing that makes it science, not math. That, that we, we believe it because of experimental data. But furthermore, say you take the mass of my fingernail and you multiply by the mass of Bill Clinton's earlobe, or whatever, and that's just an arbitrary example, but, and then you divide by the square of the distance between them, you'll get some number already, like not a, you know, not a big number, but a number. But then this equation says, now, whatever masses you are looking at, whatever radius, uh, whatever displace, whatever distance you were looking at between the two, now take that whole thing and multiply it by this capital G, this capital G, which is known as the universal gravitational constant. This capital G is not lowercase g. This capital G is not the 9.8 number. This capital G is, it's like Planck's constant or, or, or Boltzmann's constant or something like that, or Gibbs free energy, whatever. This is a constant that is is super constant. It's one number that's always true throughout the entire universe, throughout all situations. It's so constant. It's like not just for planet Earth, it's for any planet, any star. It's so constant that I can memorize it because it never changes because I always use it. It's 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. I'm not gonna ask you to memorize it. You don't have to, we'll give it to you in the test, blah, blah, blah. But just know that it never changes and, what it, and why it's there, two, two things. One thing about it is it's just there as a constant of proportionality to make the units work out. Like the truth, and it was discovered in experiment in something called a Cavendish torsion balance. Like it had to be figured out. No one made this up or thought it was like logical. It just was discovered. But all it is, is a number that makes the units work out. Like you'll notice the units of this big capital G number, the units are Newtons times meters squared. Like I'm, I'm over here right now in the notes. The units of it are Newtons times meters squared over, oh, sorry, I even made a mistake. I'm so sorry. Maybe this is actually what's in the chat. Sorry. It should be Newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared is what it should be. And I'll look in the chat in one second. Um, that looks very obscure and very complicated. And you might think, how could I ever memorize that? But no, that just is exactly what it should be. It's just saying, look, if you if you have two kil you have kilograms times kilograms up in the numerator of, of this force law, and then you have so you have kilograms squared up in the numerator. You have meters squared down in the denominator of this force law. This thing says, let's cancel out those meters. Let's cancel out those kilograms squared and be left with Newtons. This constant just basically takes the measurements that you put in and just converts them to make sure that what you get in the end is measured, uh, is a force measured in Newtons. If we didn't insist on being in Newtons, we wouldn't even need this constant if that makes sense. So it's just, it just makes the units work out. Um, but also notice it's a tiny number. Again, you don't have to memorize it, but just notice it's a tiny number, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. So that means anything that I ever plug in, if I plug in my fingernail and Bill Clinton's earlobe or whatever, Barack Obama's eyeglasses case and my, or, or Donald Trump, like it's, it's not a political thing, like whoever. And I put in my fingernail, um, mass and I put in the mass of that person's eyeglasses case I multiply them together and I divide by the number of meters between us and then I multiply by this g number 
oh, I'm going to get a tiny, tiny, tiny force, a force that exists that's there. It's happening right now. But the force of static electricity from the floor onto Bill Clinton's or Barack Obama's or Donald Trump's shoes is definitely going to be stronger than even this thing that I just calculated. So I'm saying, like, I don't walk around all day being worried about the gravitational attraction that I'm exerting on every person around me. I am. But number one, like the electricity, you know, from my shoes to the ground is stronger than any of that. So it, 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 it holds me in place. Number two, I should also add, even though right now it is true that my fingernail is pulling on, let's say again, like Bill Clinton's um, um, uh, 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 eyeglasses case. And let's say Bill Clinton's in Washington, D.C. right now. Okay, so I'm pulling, I don't know why he would be. Or I don't even know what, I'm so dating myself, but whatever. I'm pulling on some person that's in Washington, D.C. by a teeny tiny amount. Well, also, just statistically, there's some other dude. There's like Dan Yaverbaum Prime or Sun Yat Yaverbaum Prime or whatever, an equal latitude on the other side of Washington, D.C., like in Florida, pulling on Bill Clinton now also. Right. So those two, and that's what you're going to see in homework four. like these gravitational forces are happening all the time in all directions. So mostly they end up canceling each other out and we don't really care about them most of the time until we get to masses that are so massive that they're like the size of planets or stars. And they're out there isolated in outer space where other things are not happening. Once we get to masses that are as big as planets and stars, and there isn't friction in outer space and there isn't a lot of other like electrical effects going on then it starts really mattering so we start really caring about universal gravitation uh, mostly first and foremost in outer space and mostly first and foremost universal gravitation is a plug-in opportunity you're going to i'm going to start doing the plugins in one moment mostly it is just a plug-in thing that says if you got one mass over here and you got another mass over here they will automatically pull on each other, pull towards each other with a number of newtons determined by this equation. Um, and we're going to run the numbers in a second just to practice that. The, but the, but the, two, the two important takeaways of this, let me, and then I'll check the chat. Okay, quick thing to say. Well, actually, let me look at the chat for a second while you're writing that down. Oh, cool. Okay, okay. So, in a way, we're just the first number of exercises on homework four are kind of just plug in practice. If you did them already, you probably found that. If you didn't do them already, you'll see that right now we're basically just going to plug into this equation. In a way, it'll be a relief to some of you. It won't seem crazy, but 
but the reason we need the idea, we're building something from it. And there's two main things to bear in mind when we use this idea of universal gravitation. One, understand that what we're introducing here is a force that acts without physical contact. That's actually what's weird about the idea and unusual and important is that it encompasses a belief that we have as physicists that objects can affect each other without touching. And that is a crazy belief. I mean, if I had more time, believe me, I would love to read to you some of the objections that were raised during the time of Newton when he first published this idea. It's a very, and you should think about them on your own if you ever have time. It's wor Or it is one of those things where if you're at all confused for the moment, please understand it's not you. It's the universe. Like we are actually believing that the sun pulls on the earth without touching the earth. We're actually believing that the earth pulls on, on rocks without touching the rocks. That's a strange thing to believe. And we're believing that it's the same phenomenon in both cases. That is a big thing to believe. We would not believe it if we didn't think we had overwhelming evidence for believing it. And a lot of us don't wanna believe it even when we have that evidence. So, it, I mean, just understand uh, now for the moment, just to do well on exams or in this course, in a way I am asking you to believe it, but, or at least to know how to use it. We are, it does seem, we live in a world where it seems like things can pull and push on each other without touching. It seems like the sun is holding the earth in orbit around it forever. Um, I mean, we actually have slightly better explanations than that that we'll even get to called fields, but, 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 what is not required for the, for the sun to pull the earth, no air is required, no tentacles are required, no antenna or, 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 or like, like, like forklifts are required. That's what we observe in the universe. And as mysterious as that is, this equation encapsulates that idea. Um, there's one other idea too, but sorry, Vince, did you have something? Did you want to say? Or no? Was that just a, okay. So, okay. Let me know. If, okay. But the other thing is we're also, we're believing that this idea is universal. Like we're believing, when we believe that the earth is being pulled towards the sun or better, and look, we see this all the time, right? Like anything you hold, I mean, you're used to this from when you're a baby, you let something go and it falls to the ground. We're all, we all grow up with all around us, this evidence that suggests that if you don't fasten things, the earth, the center of the earth pulls things to it automatically all the time, right? Like. We don't think it's weird because we're so used to it, but it, so but think about it for a minute. We live in a universe where things automatically, if they're not fastened down, get pulled to the center of the earth, and no air or no stuff or no forklift is required for that to happen. People have known that for thousands of years. The big leap of Newton, the big leap of this equation is saying, you know what, as strange as it is to believe that about earth. Uh, or as used as, as habituated as we are to accepting this strange property of earth that it pulls things to it all the time. What Newton, thanks to Galileo said, you know what? I think it is in earth as it is in heaven. Like I think it's such a strange property of earth that I don't think it could actually be anything special about earth that makes that happen. I think everything must do that. I think the sun must do that as well. Like, so I don't know which you think is weirder and I'll look in the chat in a second, but in effect, what I'm saying about gravity is whatever you've come to accept as gravity, just being an automatic property, an automatic ability of the earth to just yank things towards it without even touching what we ultimately say in physics is, you know, as weird as, as weird as that is to accept, it'd be even weirder to think that we happen to live on a rock that was the only rock in the world that could do that. Like, why would this rock be able to do that? We come to believe that all rocks can do that and all bits of stuff do that. And the bigger the amount of stuff, the more bits are doing that. Are going to pause for a second. Is there something in the chat? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, thank you. No problem. Uh, thank you. No problem. Um, Okay, um, 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 and I appreciate that. And maybe the person was already left. Okay, um, but the second thing, oh, so the second thing is that when we talk about gravity in this equation, when we talk about M1 and M2, M1 and M2, were, they're usually written as a big M and a small M just to keep things straight for us. Like we're, we're saying that this is true of any two pairs of masses at all. So any arbitrary pair you can imagine. So if it's any arbitrary pair you can imagine, there's no, it would be silly and overly special and overly convenient to assume 
that we're only talking about identical masses. We're talking about any two masses. So a mass of three kilograms and a mass of one kilogram or a mass of seven kilograms and a mass of two, whatever, or a planet and a piece of dust. So we generally, since it's an arbitrary pair where one is larger and the other is smaller, we just designate the larger one, capital M1, and we designate the smaller one, M2. It's just to keep them straight in our minds. We still believe Newton's third law about forces. So if M1 pulls on M2, with an amount of force that's dictated by this equation, then we automatically believe by Newton's third law that M2 will pull back on M1 with the same magnitude, but in opposite direction. So M1 and M, so multiplication is commutative. Newton's third law applies. Th this force of gravity is a symmetric, neutral, reciprocal force. It just, we keep the two objects straight in our mind by referring to one of them as the big one and the other as the small, since this generally is the case. However, this is, Blue point number two. When I say big and small from now on, I mean big and small in terms of mass. We are assuming that you don't have to take up any volume in order to do this. Again, this works through empty space. So we're assuming that every bit of mass that you imagine, every point, every particle of mass that you imagine, no matter how dense or undense it is, is exerting this kind of gravity. So M1 and M2 are automatically assumed to be point masses, little bits of material that could be as heavy or as light as we wish, but that don't take up any appreciable volume, okay? Um, that's what we're assuming here, that M1 and M2 are point masses. If we want to see how anything more complicated acts, we're going to have to add up bits of masses together to get larger objects. That's ultimately what we do in, by the end of homework four and by the end of part four, okay? That said, um, I think that's another chapter. Okay, so, so that's like my quick background on how this equation works. But now we're going to practice it in homework four, mostly homework four. We're just sort of practicing it, plugging and chugging it up and stop me when you want. What time is it? Three, okay. So I'm going to literally do the questions now in homework four. Uh, Okay, so we have, okay. Right, so technically this A is like a review. It's a review of what I just said. It's a review if you've seen this before in physics one or in eighth grade or whatever. Um, but again, but by the way, I now think I've technically, I've now said everything that you need to know in order to do this. I mean, technically for whatever it's worth. So you shouldn't have to look anywhere else, but all right. So say we have, right. And I should also warn you again, Just to warn you again, because I'm starting to speed up more and more again, again, I think the best model for how to solve problems is what I gave you in the first few days more slowly with homework one. Now I'm trying to zip through a little bit more. So, so again, back to, well, I think back to certain people's questions in the direct chat, like everything I write now, if it helps you with the exam, totally do use it, but don't just do what I'm doing now. Cause I might be a little bit bare bones here. You know, I think you get it. All right. So, so, um, 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 so, right. Okay. So, in part A, we ultimately want to know the net, we ultimately want to know the net gravitational force on C. What I'm going to say, and a lot of you did totally figure this out in the homework and figured it out correctly. The net gravitational force on mass C, okay, is going to be zero. 
it is zero. We're going to, we'll do the calculation to show that. But if you see, if you're thinking that you're correct, and I, it is going to be zero, this first answer, because this it, gravitational force is a force. It is a vector. It does have direction. So A is going to pull on C toward it. It's a pull. A will pull on C toward it. B will pull on C toward it. Those two pulls and the, the sum of those two pulls, the net gravitational force on C will be the sum of those two pulls, right? Those two pulls could be different, except in this case, they won't be because all the numbers are the same. All right, so just that's the overview of what's happening here. If that's what you're thinking, you're correct. Again, if it was in homework or an exam, you have to show what I'm saying. So I'll sort of try to show that sort of quickly here, but um, the answer will be zero. Um, so I'm gonna say like the net gravitational force will be, I'll say F of, of um, M, sorry, will be F of A, C plus F of B, C, right? Plus, like there's a net force. Only if I'm careful now, let me carefully label, like let's call, if I look at my diagram here, and this is sort of the point of a diagram, I'll say let this direction be positive and this direction be negative. You could do the opposite, you know, you could flip it, but I'm going to declare before I go any further that anything to the right is positive, anything to the left is negative. So, so I think the force that A pulls on C is going to be negative, it's going to be pulled to the left, and the force that B is pulling on C is going to be positive to the right. They're going to add together, right? We're adding forces together, but they'll be in opposite directions. So there will be a negative sign on one of them. It will be a number plus the opposite of that number and we'll get zero just to summarize, right? So it is addition, not subtraction, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but it's addition of two numbers of opposite sign. More specifically, or I'm just gonna to go to the other page now, tell me if you want me to go back. Oh, oh. I'm not changing, I'm just making it clear. Sorry. One, so I'm, I'm sort of dragging it out, maybe too much, maybe too little. I'm saying that, e, so the, the force from one of them is that G number, which you don't have to memorize, but it is the same number every time, times the mass of one, times the mass of the other, and we're just told that the masses are all the same, divided by the distance squared. I think the distance is five, right? Because we're calculating the force on that middle mass, mass C, which is right in the middle of that 10 meter stretch. So it's five squared. And I think that the force of the other one is exactly the same, but the first one has a minus sign because it's toward uh, to the left. And the second one has a plus sign because it's toward the right. So I could do out these numbers now, but it's clear that the numbers are the same. So I think the answer is zero. And I think that that is the answer to...
And that's supposed to be just a quick practice. And believe me, we will multiply that. You have to be careful when you multiply the numbers out on a calculator, and we will do that in a minute. But that's also just a practice in showing like forces do superpose. Like we do believe that forces add according to vectors and they do take into account their signs when they add. So this is why even though gravity like dominates, why gravity exists everywhere on the surface of planet Earth, it doesn't matter all the time because it's constantly canceling itself out. That's sort of just what we're trying to say there. Um, I think I'm going to keep go. So that's that's A, okay? Just like a practice exercise. Professor, and, where oh, do sorry. you get the positive sign from? And can you go back one second, please? Uh, yeah, I'll go back. Right, good question. So, and that's a good question for two reasons. So the positive sign is because the second force, the force, because direction matters. So if I call everything to the right positive, and if I call everything to the left negative, then that first object, um, A, pulled the center, like everything is pulling toward. Every, uh, uh, every gravitational force is a pull. So, a, so, sorry, let me just look at my picture again. So A, yeah, A is pulling C toward it to the left, and I call that negative, so I put the negative sign in, but B is pulling C to the right, and right, I'm calling positive. So they're both a pull, but they're a pull in opposite directions. So I gave B a plus sign. I don't know if that, but the reason that's a good question, and this may also answer the question. I mean, that's my answer. But another part of the answer is what one of the reasons Juanita might be asking that. It is a good question, is because if you all notice, when I first gave you the equation, when I actually wrote the equation just before any numbers got plugged in, I actually put a negative sign in there, which is kind of a choice on my part. And that might be confusing people. Like you might think then that always all the numbers will always have negatives on them. The, that's not quite the case. The reason I put the negative there, I mean, we'll see this more later when we get into the vector stuff. But the reason I put the negative even in the original equation itself is because is to show that it's a pull. The negative right there when I just write the equation means that this force is always toward the object exerting the force. So like if I don't have a coordinate system yet, if I don't know which way is positive or negative, I have a negative in the original formula just to say it's always in the direction of pull. It's always attraction. If this were, for example, like proton, proton repulsion or something, then I would have called the formula, I would have put in the formula a plus sign. So that's a long way. So that's why it really is fair that one is asking that, like, where did I suddenly get a plus over there in the example? What I'm really trying to say is in the raw formula, in the raw equation, before any numbers are plugged in, the negative sign just tells us attraction, tells us pull. Then every time we have an example, we have to kind of decide what direction is positive, what's negative, and, and go accordingly. Does that, does that make sense? Hopefully, maybe sort of kind of... Um, well, I'll, go, I'll let, I'll keep going. Oh, oh chat, 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 chat. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. So hopefully that made sense. Maybe let me know if that didn't make sense, but yes, 5,000 squared. Yes, it would totally be okay. Someone wrote in the chat, is it okay to write 5,000 squared instead of whatever I wrote? Yes, it totally would. And it would be okay to do out all these numbers. I'm, I'm talking so much, I'm just sort of trying. Yes, anything you do to make numbers work is okay. And, and frankly, we're just doing the numbers now to practice, to see how this works. But Ultimately, when we do this, usually like in the in the exam or whatever, there won't. It's not really about the numbers anyway. But yes, five thousand squared is totally fine. All right. So that's our answer to that one. Hopefully, the plus minus thing made sense. So now I'm going. So, to Professor, are you saying um, when it's a negative sign, that means the pull is to the left, and a positive, the pull is to the right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, cool. No, thank you. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah. Okay, so then the next one, sorry, so back to, I'm just probably, all right, so then now B, same scenario, except now we actually do have to run the numbers. Now it's just to force us to practice numbers and to see this is also on Juanita's thing here to see again how okay like the net gravitational force on an object is the sum of all the forces acting on it but we have to take into account direction and so if either of the two masses are different or the distances are different then the forces will be different and we will actually have to be careful so here we go so i'm going to do the same calculus so we want 
the force on C, we want the force on C, um, but taking into account uh, slightly different distances. C is close to the right. Right, so here it's like this. So we want, again, the net gravitational force on C. So we're going to add them both up again. Now the masses are still the same. So yeah, we can do what person in the private chat said. I could do 5,000 squared, sure. Now this time, the distance here for AC is 4 squared. So I'm actually going to do out these numbers now because they're not actually going to cancel out. So, and it is weird numbers and you do have to be careful. One, you have to do it on, I would, I'm doing this on my calculator. One thing I might do to make my life a little bit easier is keep it all in scientific notation. So totally, totally, how is this going on as well? Am I crazy? I'm crazy. I'm losing my mind. I'm totally. Okay. So I'm totally okay. So I get. Now someone could check me on this. I mean, I think I remember this answer from people's homework, but this is not my final answer yet. And I am going to speed up a little bit in a minute, but I get, in other words, for the first force, for the force of A exerted on C, the leftward pull on C from A, I get negative and the negative just means to the left, 1.04 times 10 to the negative fourth Newtons. That's a very small force, right? Like, like, like the decimal point is all the way to the left. There's a very small force. That's just a force of AC. Then on the next page, I now do the force of BC, and that one's going to be positive because it's just in the other direction. Same constant, same masses. And I'm thinking that 5,000 squared is 2.5 times 10 to the seventh. You can check on a calculator that. But now here, the denominator will be different, right? It's not 4 squared. Now it's 6 squared, which is 36. And for sure, you know, you have to be careful on the calculator with this part. I mean, I do. I think you all probably do. So it's the same thing as before, but now divide by 36. So now this one is like 4 point. And I feel like I do remember these numbers from your homeworks, which is a good sign for everybody. Uh, oh. Huh. Now this is interesting. Uh, now, anybody who did do the homework and got it back, you might want to check right now if you got the same answers. Uh, 
they're familiar to me, but there's something making me slightly insecure about them actually. Um, I, I think it should be 16 points, uh, six, seven, I think it was. Yeah, I think there is a mistake. Uh, in, in which one, in the other one? The, wait. Uh, just multiplying 2.5 times 6.67. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's four. Um, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Oh, good. Huh. Yeah, you're, that's a good point. Wait, wait, wait. You're, yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. Hold on. You're, I agree. Hold on a second. Yeah, something did seem wrong. Okay, thank you. I don't even know who just said that, but thank you. Hold on a second. Who was that, Jacob? Well, it doesn't matter. All right. But you agree to this? You agree to here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so why did that happen? That is a good point. Oh, I think I do know what happened. Oh, wait, but the, wait a minute though. I was already taking into account the 36 when I did it. So I'm saying this, wait, so I'm actually a little bit, I'm saying, I'm saying this. Do you agree with that? Um, yeah, 1.67 times 10 to the negative third in the numerator? Yeah, that looks good. Oh, okay. So then, so I think I just skipped a step before, but then, okay. All right. Then if we, I'm a little surprised by this number myself, but okay. It, but thank you. That's, so then to wrap this up, what we're saying, so what we're saying is, one, I'm going to flip the page. What we're saying is one force is 1.04 times 10 to the negative fourth in to the left. The other force is 4.63 times 10 to the negative fifth to the right. So to get the full force, like we're adding them together, but one of them is getting a negative sign. So like they're not canceling each other out because they're different. And, and in fact, the one to the right, oh yeah, okay. This, the one to the right notice is a lot smaller, the force Pulling to the right on C is a lot smaller, a lot smaller than the force pulling to the left uh, on C simply and only because that second particle, particle B, is, is substantially farther away than the other particle. And I, I say substantially farther away. It doesn't even seem that farther away. It's like a difference of, it's a distinction of six meters to four meters. But once the distance is squared, it ends up making a big difference in the denominator. That's sort of what we're trying to see here. And so we end up saying, okay, the net gravitational force on C equals literally 4.63 times 10 to the fifth minus the other one, which minus 1.04 times 10 to the fourth and be careful now that's kind of weird like it's to the right minus one to the left but the one to the right oh i'm sorry these are negative exponents but they're negative exponents so the one to the right is actually a lot smaller so we're taking a small number and subtracting from it a big number so our answer will be a negative right our answer should be negative it should um and it will be um and, and um, it will be very close to the 1.04 answer because 10 to the negative fifth barely makes a difference. On, in other words, it will be.
Okay. Um, tedious to be sure. I mean, even I find it tedious, but that's, so that's the answer to that one. So we, it's plugging and chugging, but it's just understanding that the forces superpose like this, that you add the two forces together, taking into account minus signs in order to get the full force. That's the answer to that one. Um, and I'm sorry it took so long. Um, and there's not much more interesting to say about it. Uh, I mean, you, you could still ask questions if you want, and I am watching the time. I know we have 35 minutes. Um, so that's that. Okay. And then C. Right, I'm sort of rephrasing. So question C on that sheet, and I hope you have the sheet in front of you. I, I mean, I, it's hard for me to switch the screens back and forth, but the C says, okay, now assume the same scenario as problem B, but we're gonna change the magnitude of mass B. What mass, oh, sorry, what mass should, what, what mass should we give B, it says, I'm sorry, so that the two forces uh, on C cancel each other out assuming these new distances that we just used a second ago in other words we want the left hand force with those num with that distance of, of four to cancel out the right hand force with the distance of six but we want it to cancel out literally so we want to adjust the mass so in other words we're saying this and again it, this is kind of just out there's no calculus here there's no trigonometry it all seems like a departure because it is a slightly different topic but there it is anyway. Um, to do it, we do this. We want, we want FAC to equal FBC. Um, we want the absolute values of them to be equal to each other. So, um, so I'm not even gonna worry about signs this time. What we want is we want Right, uh, and I hope that's like, we just want the two forces to equal each other. We want the GMM over R squared from one to equal the GMM over R squared for the other, right? So, but the Gs are the same on both sides. So even though I wrote them out just to be clear, they won't even matter, they'll cancel out. Also, you know, mass C is involved in both of those equations and mass C is 5,000 in both cases. So one of the 5,000s cancel out, cancels out on each side. In other words, to make this, this problem is not as hard as it sounds, what we really have is we want 5,000 over 16 to equal M over 36. It comes down to that. I, I mean, I hope that's sort of clear. To, um, so we're just solving for M such that those two equations balance. I'm gonna to go to the next page now. You can tell me if I need to go back. Um, Right, and I could even reduce these or something, but I think it's already clear. And I'm gonna cross multiply in order to solve for M, right? I'm gonna say 16 M, and, and the M that I'm looking for is the mass of B, right? So 16 M B equals 36 times 5,000. Um, I, I, I could find a common, but I don't think it's necessary. So 16 M B, well, equals, I mean, there's various ways you can do this, but.
Okay, and that that's the answer to that one. Again, stop me if there's any questions of now. That is all in a principle practice with how gravity works and practice with the idea that any one bit of mass pulls every other bit of mass. And what we're really saying there, if you want to step back, like don't get too bogged down in the numbers. The numbers are tedious, as you can tell, they're even sort of annoying me. But but the thing to see from that is that the 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 gravitational pull on point C throughout this problem was always the sum total, the superposition of both of the poles from A and B. That's really what we're trying to get across here. Doc, let me write that down. That's, that's really the takeaway. that the force on C is the sum of all of the forces from A and B. And these forces are vectors, I'm trying to emphasize, and vectors have direction, minus signs matter. So things can cancel out. That's really what we're trying to get at here, okay? Because now I'm gonna, I'm gonna in a way move faster. Now we get, that's practice with point masses. What happens now in part two and part three of this homework, is it starts asking us what's going on if we have bigger objects than just points? Like what if we have entire spheres? What happens then? Well, the prince, the, so, so now we're in part two. Okay, we're gonna say now, gravitational forces obey superposition. That is, all forces obey superposition. That is to say that they add like vectors, that the sum of a bunch of forces acting on one object is the vector sum of all those forces, period. We're gonna say that. We're also gonna say, we're also gonna believe that space is symmetric, that is, one cubic centimeter of space in the Andromeda galaxy is indistinguishable from one cubic centimeter of space on planet Earth or one cubic centimeter of, of, of space like, like in the orbit of the moon or something like that. Like space is space is space everywhere. It's the same everywhere and all directions in space are the same everywhere. There's no actual X or Y or Z axis in space. Uh, those are just names we give axes. All axes are indistinguishable from one another in space. Okay, I'm, I'm believing those two things. That's why I wrote superposition and symmetry up here at the top of the page. It's two principles I'm going to believe in when I'm looking at how gravity works in some larger body. Any larger body I have, I'm going to look at as a collection of lots and lots of little tiny particles, little tiny point masses. And I'm going to believe 
that if I want to know how much gravitational force like the sun or some like big round sphere exerts like the sun, I'm going to believe that it's the vector sum, the vector superposition of all of the little bits of mass comprising the sun. And I'm also going to believe that since space is symmetric, if like if all of the bits of mass are arranged in a kind of a symmetric way, if they're all arranged in a sphere, then um, then all their cancellations, their vector cancellations, will probably fall into some sort of symmetric pattern, just the way all the point masses are falling into a symmetric shape. Okay, I'm, I'm going to believe, in other words, that a bit of mass over here in the top left corner of the sun doesn't count any more than a bit of mass in the lower right hand corner of the, not that there are corners of the sun, but okay, that each little bit counts as much as every other bit. Okay, therefore, so I'm saying that those are like background beliefs that I have here about space and about matter. Um, therefore, in uh, these questions about like Luna Staten and I am not in all of this, well, I'm just gonna write down the answers really quick. I mean, again, hopefully, even if you didn't do this, hopefully you have the sheet in front of you, or if you know you look at the sheet later and you'll look at my answers and you'll see what I'm saying. I'm saying Just lost my board. Did I? Wait. Sorry. I. You can see my board, but I can't write on it. So hold on. Oh, you didn't see anything I wrote. God. Sorry. Hold on. Let's see. Actually, wait, this is right, but this is important if I'm going to write it on the, well, I'm going to write this on the next page. It's important enough. These three answers that I just wrote are the answers to the question on the homework. I'm going to, I'm just writing the answers. I'm going to explain now why I wrote them this way. And the explanation is really the important thing for the exam.
Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to say this. This, this now again. Um, yeah, all right. Um, there's two super important ideas that I want to give you in the next 13 minutes. The two, only two ideas that I want you to have in order for you to be able to finish all parts one through four of this exam. I'm going to think in the back of my mind what I, I'll either post something about part five or I'll get rid of part five or something. But as far as, but parts one through three, I think you're already totally set. As far as parts four, as far as part four, there's calculations and thoughts to be done, but there's two important ideas that will get you remaining, that will get you through all of part four. And I'm gonna say them, I can easily say them within the next 12 minutes, fully proving them or fully justifying them or fully um, accounting for them uh, is tricky to do in 12 minutes. So I'm only gonna hold you guys accountable for whatever I do. That is, I want you to know these two ideas that I'm about to say. Uh, by the end of this course, I want you to believe, uh, understand them fully and I'm gonna explain them more and more. As far as the exam is concerned, when you get these two ideas, you don't have to fully justify them because I'm not about to fully prove them. I mean, you can, but you only have to prove them or explain them as well as I'm about to do right now. Idea number one, I just wrote. Idea number one, so we can call this idea number one. Idea number one is this, it, is that if we accept the ideas of superposition and symmetry, if we accept the idea that gravitational forces add as vectors, and space is all the same everywhere. In other words, one bit of, of a sphere doesn't matter any more than another bit of a sphere. What we can show, what it turns out, is that if you collect a whole bunch of bits of mass into a big ball, into a big sphere, okay, a huge sphere, put it over here, like we're doing in the problem, and then you put another particles like far away from that sphere, and you ask, how much is this whole sphere pulling on the little particle? Well, it turns out that all the cancellations work out nicely enough, like all the bits on the top will pull this ball up and will pull it, all the bits over here on top will pull this particle to the left and up. All the bits on the bottom will pull this particle to the left and down. They will all cancel each other out all nicely so that what's left is that this particle, as you might expect, will be pulled directly to the center of the whole thing and the whole thing will act as though there were just one super massive point located right at its center. In other words, something you've all always known and always take it for granted probably, but I'm saying now, I'm, I'm asserting it as a piece of knowledge that like when you're pulled towards the center of the earth, it's just that you're pulled toward the center of the earth and you're pulled by the total mass of the earth, six times 10 to the 24th kilograms of the earth. But all of the bits of the earth, like a little bit right below your feet is pulling on you and a little bit all the way on the other side of the earth, like in China is pulling on you and a bit in Antarctica is pulling you, and all the bits together are all combining to make one big effect as though there was just a super massive particle right in the center of the earth pulling you toward the center. That's the way superposition and symmetry come together to make that effect. We could show that with a lot of integrals and stuff. And in fact, I could post a video about that. I'm not going to ask you to do that right now. I'm asking you to see or to accept the idea for the moment that if you're outside a big solid sphere, the big solid sphere will act as though it were just a particle located at its center. In, in other words, the way we've always treated Earth, if you've ever known anything about gravity or heard anything about gravity, that's the way we've always treated the gravity of Earth up until now. I'm just flagging it as an explicit statement. I'm going to go on, though. I'm going to say one more thing. Okay, one more flip side of this.
Okay, I've got eight minutes left. And I, again, I apologize, it's gonna go a little bit quickly, but I'm saying now, the, con, the flip of this. So on the one end, if you picture a big spherical solid or a big spherical shell or whatever, if you arrange a bunch of points into a big round thing and you get outside that round thing, the round, the big round thing will pull you as though, it, it, as though there were just a, a super massive point located at the center. However, if you get inside, which is the last bit of homework four, if you get inside the shell, okay, it turns out that all these cancel, all of the superposition of all the vector sums will all cancel out to zero. If you are anywhere inside, and, and yes, to really, really prove this takes a little while and I'm not doing it now, so I'm not gonna ask you to fully explain this on the exam, you can't, because I didn't explain it to you, but, this, but these two ideas together, I want you to know these two ideas together as one big idea called Newton's shell theorem. You can refer to it as Newton's shell theorem. It says if you're outside a big spherical shell, it'll all pull you as though it was just a big point located at its center. And if you, so there will be a lot of gravity. In other words, if you're outside a big spherical shell or spherical solid, but if you're inside the shell, it will all cancel out to zero. If you're inside, um, I'm looking at the time. Why those two ideas are, so together, all you have to say about that, like in an exam or anything, is that that's Newton's shell theorem. I, and I'm gonna justify it more to you after the exam. Don't think, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. But as far as your responsibility to me, that is called Newton's shell theorem, those two ideas together of, of how to deal with big solids. And what this all means to us, okay, now I'm gonna do a big jump here. I don't have six minutes, just follow with me. I'm gonna jump literally to the question four in the exam, like how this relates to the exam. If you've practiced gravity enough and you follow this idea, and this is the trickiest idea, you might have to think about it on your own or discuss it, but it's called Newton's shell theorem. It's how to deal with a big massive shell if you're on the outside or a big massive shell if you're on the inside. How this re relates to exam part four, and I have six minutes, but that will be enough. I'm going to do it quickly, but just follow me and think about it. In part four of the exam, whoop, can I just lose it again? Okay. And I'm gonna tell you right now as a compromise too, I'm doing this fast. I'm giving you enough that you need, but you will have to think about this. This will be the hardest part about the whole exam. I think you're fully prepared for every other part. This part, you're gonna to have to work and think through a bit, but as a compromise, now I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're paying attention still and you're still with me for the last five minutes, I, you, I won't ask you about part five on the exam. I'm just gonna drop it. Like part five of the midterm, you can look at it and study if you want, but it won't be part of your exam. Your exam will be at most the four, if you're listening to me right now, this is your reward for listening. Okay, I you won't be asked about part five. You, I will ask you about part four. So that'll be the hardest part for all of you. So just like try to get this, what I'm about to say, and just get it down and then think hard about it. I'm saying in part four of the exam, you're asked about a solid sphere. You're asked about if you are inside here, some bigs, you're asked if you're inside somewhere, at a lower at a variable radius lowercase r of some big solid planet that has cap that has wait, so, or is it maybe it's question three i'm sorry it might be question three it might be yeah i don't remember you might be right um but it's the gravity question i'm talking about right now in the exam so you, to all of you again i've got three minutes don't worry about part five of the practice exam i'm just going to drop it okay but i do want you to worry about this this will be the hardest part but you'll get it if you hear me in the next three minutes I'm saying you're asked about the force inside a solid sphere. The big trick, if you could follow me, it's, the big insight is I just told you, wait, oh yeah, there'll be three total questions in the actual exam, right? I just, there'll be any three of the four that are in your practice midterm, right? I think we're on the same page, yes, yes. I'm just saying that number five from the practice midterm, you can drop, you can all drop as like a compromise to the fact that I'm doing this part fast. Okay, but yes, I think we're good. Um, oh, and technically I have eight minutes, don't I? Oh, okay, wait, I can take a breath for a second. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. We have to 355, right? Okay, 
So this will be fine. So let me just breathe for a second. I, this is the hardest part where I'm going to tell you all now. If you can get it, you can get everything. You might have to think about it and like play the tape again or look at the notes again. I am going to go a little faster than I wanted to, but I'm going to give it to you. But then also as a compromise for that, don't worry about the fifth question in the practice. Just drop it, all of you, okay? So, okay, I think we're on the. So in the gravity question of the midterm, it gives you a solid sphere, like the moon or something. It gives you a solid sphere. And it says you're somewhere inside a solid sphere. And it asks you to figure out the net gravitational force there. And then it asks you funny questions about that. Here is the, and again, I'm watching the clock. We have seven minutes. Please stay with me. It asks you about a solid sphere. Now, what I'm telling you, I just told you about what would happen if you were outside a solid sphere. And I also told you what would happen if you were inside a shell. I didn't prove them, but I told you, and I told you they're called Newton's shell theorem. You can, that's enough for you to say on the exam. I'm saying if you're outside a big solid sphere, it'll just act as though it were a big massive point at its center. And if you were inside a shell, the whole thing will cancel to nothing. Here in the exam, it's asking you, what if you were inside, somewhere inside a solid? If you were at like radius lowercase r, somewhere inside in the interior of a solid sphere of capital R. Here's why that's an important question. And here's how you answer it. It's, again, it's like the hardest question in the whole exam if I didn't tell you what I'm about to tell you right now. If you're inside a solid sphere, Oh, God. Okay, sorry, sorry. Listen closely to this. Once you get it, it's so easy and so obvious. Once you get it, but until you do, you don't. I'm saying if you're somewhere inside a solid, like you're this big solid ball of radius capital R, I'll try to draw it again. You're in, you're, there's this big ball of, so, of capital radius given constant radius R, but you're like over here at lowercase r, okay? You're like right here. If you think about it, where and I'm trying to figure out what's the net gravitational effect on you, like what happens to you there? I haven't said that yet. I've said what happens outside a ball, and I've said what happens inside a shell. But I'm saying now, if you're in, at this solid, in, at this point inside the solid interior, if you're in effect standing right here, you're getting, what you are experiencing is the total effect of this thing that's under your feet plus this thing that's above your head. You're in the superposition of two objects. You're if you're inside a solid ball, you're on a you're in effect standing on top of a smaller inner planet, and there's this shell everywhere around you outside. Please focus on that. Like, even if you don't get that now, that's the thing to think about later. If you're standing in the middle of a solid interior, you're getting the effects of everything underneath your feet and everything above your head. Well, everything above your head cancels out. That's a shell. It all cancels out to zero. The shell outside cancels to zero, we just said. So all that's left all that is pulling you, the entire effect that's pulling you is just that big ball underneath your feet, the inner subplanet, which all acts like one point at its center. So in order to know the net gravitational force on something inside a solid, all we have to know is how much mass is in the inner piece at radius R. We'll call it like the submass, MS. 
And here's the D and, and we've got three minutes left. So all we need, so in other words, the total, the net gravitational force on you will just be GMS times your mass over your radius squared. That's it. But what, and we've got two minutes, right? So that's all. So my argument is if you're inside the interior of a big solid, the total net gravitational effect on you is only all the solid material under your feet, only at the radius you're standing, only at little r. So as long as we know what that total mass is expressed in terms of knowns, we, we have the answer. And we know that the density of this whole thing, if you read the problem, the density of the whole thing is uniform. The density is constant. Like every bit of mass per every bit of equivalent volume is the same. Like for every cubic centimeter, there's one kilogram or whatever. So, and I know I'm going fast. So I just have to like, look at this later, I'll just copy it now. But I'm saying, to, if we're looking for this, if we're, sorry, if we're looking for what the mass of the inner planet is, we just say mass of the inner planet is to total mass as volume of the inner planet is to total volume. And the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi. I know I'm doing this fast, but four thirds pi r cubed. The volume of the total given sphere is four thirds capital R cubed. So the fours cancel, the pi's cancel, the threes cancel. And we're left with the mass of the inner planet is the total mass times r cubed over k. And this is all work you can do. As long as you understand it, you can do this. And we're, so and we're just about done. We've got one minute. We plug this back into the gravity formula and we'll be done. But watch what happens when we do. We plug this back in. And we get that the total mass, the total gravitation on us is this. And these cancel, so we get this. And the reason we just did all this work, the reason we just did all this work with one minute left in the class, the reason we did all this work is notice, in this weird case of being inside a solid mass sphere, once we know how gravity works, gravity is this weird inverse R squared force, and I am looking at the time, but notice, once we take this inverse R squared force that we practiced with point masses at the beginning of homework four, once we apply it to the inside of a solid sphere and we work it through carefully, and you'll look again later, we find a force that is directly proportional to displacement. In other words, we with a negative sign. In other words, we get, we get a Hooke's law situation we which means and i'm just about i'm done now sorry for keeping you but the reason you go through all this work and you'll have to think about it but the reason the tie in between all this sudden gravity that we're talking about out of nowhere is that if we set up gravity inside the solid sphere of earth if we were to take a tunnel and drop it all the way through one side of the earth or a moon or any other big solid sphere. Okay. And I'll get you in one second and anybody who has to go, go, but, or just bear with me for like one more minute. Cause this is the conclusion of this, what this all shows and you can finish working through the problem and you'll see, and maybe I'll post a solution. But what this shows is that if we were to make a tunnel going through the whole solid earth, like from one side to the other, through the center, if we make a tunnel through the solid earth, the way gravity works at any point in that tunnel is it pulls in a manner that is directly proportional to displacement from the center like normally gravity is inverse r squared but this shows that inside a solid sphere gravity would pull in a matter that's directly proportional to r in other words like in other words the second derivative of the, the position would be directly proportional to the position with a negative sign in other words hook's law in other words simple harmonic oscillation in other words if you drop a rock from one side of the tunnel and let it go to the other it'll Gravity will act just like a spring. The rock will get faster and faster as it goes to the center. It'll build up kinetic energy and speed, but it'll lower its acceleration, but it'll build up its jerk, all that stuff. And if you want to know how much time it takes to get to the other side, which is what the problem is, you just have to figure out the omega from this, which you totally can. The omega is just the square root of that constant. The omega is the square root of this. Put two pi over that and you have period, you have time. That's how you solve that problem in the exam. Of course, you'll have to think about this, but the key point I'm making is if you're inside a solid sphere, you are in between 
one solid sphere and a shell. So your gravity is entirely based on just the solid sphere under your feet, which ends up meaning it's Hooke's law of gravity, simple harmonic oscillation. That's it. If you have to go, go, please go. I will stay to answer questions, obviously, because I was a lot. But and there's no problem five on the exam. I'm like, there's no problem five. Don't worry about problem five. But this is as hard as it gets on the exam. That's it. Please go. You have to go, but I'll stay. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Yes, have a great week. Okay. Um, okay. And oh, sorry, Avery Yeller, go. Avery Yeller, go. Professor, can you um put the previous page for one sorry, second? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, absolutely. So what you just did with <laughs> these two pages, um kind of like like general uh analysis that's kind of what you meant when you asked on the sheet uh expresses a function of given fundamental constants what is gravitational force exerted uh like that for three and two is is that what you're doing right now because that confused me that, no yes and i'm sorry i went so fast but yes no that okay. was fast and confusing but totally what i yes it was that part i i didn't make it explicit but yes that's and in this case since it's like the first time I'm doing it, what i just did here as long as you can follow it as long as you get it that's like all you have to do for your version on the exam. Like you, you don't have to pull in other integrals or anything like that. Is like, but yes, that's the part I was doing. That's right. That's right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Okay. Any other? Uh, uh, any other? Have a great day, Professor. Thank See you, you Monday. Yes. Have a great. Yes. See you Monday. Awesome. Thank you. Everybody else. Good. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Bye. Okay. Supervisor. Oh, see ya. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay, thanks. Matthew, you good? Professor. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions, I think. Okay. That, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so, how many questions is the exam again? So, your exam will be three questions. It, it's either going to literally and parts, right? Like, you know, like, three a, parts. like right. a, B, C, like, like, you know, right. Three okay. long things. That's right. That's okay. Right. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and this can be, it's going to be based on, um, like, like certain homework assignments or, or all the that we have so far. Well, it, there are, it's based on the homework assignments and, and only the ones we've had so far, but more specifically, it literally take that the, the, the practice exam that's in your Google classroom, the practice exam that I posted yesterday, literally your exam, that, that practice exam has five parts in it. First yeah. of all, you could just get rid of the fifth part. Just ignore like, Oh, not, cause I was looking at it like last night and um, the, I think the first two parts I recognized immediately that the fourth and fifth one, I didn't, you know, really, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like recognize that off the ballot. Oh, okay. right, right. Fair enough. So the fifth one I never got to, so that's on me. So forget the fifth, just forget. But the fourth is what I just did right now in these notes. So basically, yeah, I, yeah, I, I realized look, when you were doing it, that, that, that the fourth part was what you were covering today on the class. Right. So, so yeah, so the exam will be literally, it'll just be three questions taken from those four that you have, like, it won't even be different. Or, I mean, I might change some numbers, but basically, if you're looking at those four questions in the practice, your actual exam will be three out of those four, uh, either, uh, like, like, I mean, it'll either just literally be three, or I'll give you two of them, and I'll say you can have a choice between these other two or something. But it's literally gonna, your exam will literally look just like that practice exam, only shorter. Okay. okay. Um, um, are you get, are you, are you get partial credit on the exams, right? Definitely, yes, a lot, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, um, um and I, I was just asking, cause uh, I mean, um, I'm, um, it's funny, not cause, um, 